It should be illegal. I'm just saying you shouldn't do it. No, come on. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hey, I would like to call the Craig City Council meeting July 14, 2020, to order. Um, First up is the approval of minutes from the June 23rd, 2020 meeting. So moved. Second. It was, motion was made to approve by Councilman James, seconded by Councilman Nichols to approve the minutes from the June 23rd, 2020 meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Up next is item 2B, approval of minutes from the July 8th, 2020 special meeting. So moved. Second. Motion was made to approve by Councilman James, seconded by Councilman Hess. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Up next is item three, and that's approval of July 2020 bills in the amount of $967,662.25. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the July bills in the amount of nine hundred and sixty-seven thousand six hundred and sixty-two and twenty-five cents. Second. Motion was made by Councilman Boyer, seconded by Councilman Mazuka, to approve the July twenty twenty bills. One more time, for the record, in the amount of nine hundred sixty-seven thousand six hundred sixty-two dollars and twenty-five cents. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Up next is the approval of the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda as presented. Second. Yeah. Motion was made by Councilman James, seconded by Councilman Mazuka, to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so up next is public comment. Um, just as a quick reminder, we ask that if uh, you approach the a podium and you give us your name and address for the record, <laughs> And I will start by asking Liz, do we have anybody out there in the virtual world that has anything for us tonight? Do not. Do not. Okay. So that opens it up to the floor here in the audience, which is nice to see. Thank you. I am glad to see that there's, we get more and more every time. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's getting better. Please. Danny Morley, 636 Taylor Street. Uh, I just have two comments. Uh, the first one is how much I appre appreciate Parks and Rec. The flowers in town are looking great. Their watering program is great. I love seeing our community look so nice. My second comment is I want to congratulate you on picking Mr. Campbell. As you know, the curb and gutter on Taylor Street is a pretty big project. He is there at least once a day supervising that and making sure that a good job is done for the city. And as a resident of that street, I really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Last time we had to like drag you up here. This I'm glad you're doing this. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, my attitude's improving. <laughs> so, so I would like to also commend Trevor and his department. All of these guys, I think they are awesome, uh, doing a great job. Ryan, great job. His department is doing a great job, and Mark. The water department is awesome and doing a great job. So, and of course, Peter and Melanie are always awesome. So I just want to say thank you. I think we have a great group of city workers in a great city and I'm really happy. So I think I'll probably stay for a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to hear that. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Okay, hearing none, we are going to close public comment and move to number six presentations. Um, up first, we have uh, Amy Peck, VP of Nursing and Chief Nursing Officer for Memorial Regional Health to give council an update on the future of EMS. 
evening, everyone. Thank you again for your time and letting me come this evening to present to you. I did want to come and present um, an update as to where we are. When I spoke last and shared our struggles with EMS and the cost, um, you guys gave me a challenge to go back to the fire board and to, um, to the county and get them to participate in the $17,500 that we're asking for for the 2021 um, mill levy campaign for EMS. Um, since then, and um, Mr. Nichols can help to explain to that, but I have gotten approval from both the fire board and the county commissioners, as long as the city is willing to participate and, Mo and MRH, who has also said that they are willing to participate. So with that being said, what the future would look like if we can get the money from you is I would ask for one of you as a council member to be on our committee. We would like one from the fire board, one from the county, one from MRH and one from the city. Just to help guide um, through some of these discussions, it um, became apparent, um, like with the fire, there's gonna be a lot of questions asked of us as to why the fire isn't taking over the ambulance services. And um, I think as a unit, um, we've talked about becoming a team from the very beginning, but as a team, I think we need to present why, um, how important it is to also preserve our fire department and what they have to offer, especially with what the future has to hold. So I'm coming to ask or answer any other questions. I do have Staten, who is our EMS director with me, um, who can also help answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Council, any questions? Mr. Peck? No, I don't have any questions. We were, went through this at the fire district. Sure. So, so you've gotten um, commitments from the fire district and also the hospital and, and the county as well? Or Okay. Just Everybody has agreed to put it into their budget okay. um, for 2021. Um, so we get to move forward with that. But do we have a reason why we're not doing it? I guess I never heard that um, one. You want to hear? Yeah. I would love to hear why we're not combining them. Um, <clears throat> you know, it comes down to the level of service, and I think the community needs to um, decide what level of service that they want from EMS. It's a, it's a vital service to the community. It's essential. Um, the EMS Memorial Regional Health is running over 2,000 calls a year. Craig Fire currently runs somewhere 500, depending on wildland season. You know, number one, we just did not have the staff to take over, you know, that kind of uh, increase in call volume. Memorial Regional Health is already, you know, in that area with staff and personnel. Um, we just thought from the standpoint, number one, we can't, con uh, their loss is, on, is over our total operating budget for the year, our operation side what they're losing on providing this level of service. And from that standpoint, uh, the district felt um, unless we can come to some compromise on the level of service, staffing level, um, you know, the district doesn't have full-time employees. We have one administrative assistant. Um, Memorial Regional Health, whether you're at 12 FTEs? Yes. 12 FTEs. You know, so to, to pick that up, I. We decided it would be better uh, to help support Memorial Regional Health and continue their service if feasible. If, you know, if feasible. So I guess I, I guess my question would be then, they're not, ad to combine the fire department and the EMS, they're not asking firefighters to become running the ambulance to staff that. I would think that the <coughs> people that are staffing it right now would move over there they're not asking anybody to <laughs> go am, am i am i misunderstanding something i guess i guess that's my uh without a uh, new source of funding you know ems nationally it's not just craig nationally is not a it's a service uh, it has to have a source of revenue medicare or medicaid reimbursement rates will not support they cannot bill for their services so for the fire district to take this without a, a new source of revenue, um, we, w we would be in the same situation as Memorial okay. Regional. But we're doing this as a mill levy 
for right. them that would add to the I, I guess I'm just like I, I don't know I guess I'm maybe you could help I think, me I think another big point to add to this is the fire district the actual lines of the district boundaries are significantly smaller than the service area that EMS would provide that service to so I think that was another uh, challenge that uh, you still have to decide how, how big this district would be but that's part so. of what that money is going to go for that's going to go for attorneys to help to decide those lines to help us get that done and drawn up appropriately because um, there are several steps that need to be taken to do that I guess I just look at the future and realize that we're as a city we're looking to cross every bridge we can with the county that's our goal is because we know that we don't know what is held in the next five years, 10 years. We, we know that Tri-State came out and said 2028 for Unit 2. And so I guess I'm looking at it more like anything we can combine to save money and to be better makes way more sense. Um, and maybe we don't have all the answers yet, right? I get, I get, I get that. Um, but just to say, well, we're just going to go on our own, we all know mill levies are very tough to pass in Moffa County. And so I guess that's why I was thinking something's already established. How do we, how do, how does that look instead of just saying it's not going to work, I guess. And my Boyer, we all know that not one of us of those four entities that is in partnership together can, is, can continue to sustain this on its own. Right. It, now the fire, so I'm sorry. of where it lands, um, we still have to go to the voters and ask for money because not one of us can afford $750,000 loss a year. Right. Um, and that's just the struggle and that's part of, you know, the problem. Um, across the country, it's supported by taxpayers. Right. And we, we got to give it a shot. And you're right, maybe we don't exactly know where it lands. It may still stay with MRH. Who knows what that looks like? But do they have the guidance um, with that piece of it? Um, I, I, we have to move forward with some sort of a mill levy. And I understand. I yeah. just think that you're going to pass it in the voters, in my opinion only, way easier when you say we're not creating something new. We are combining to make something better. And I, I think that's on the campaign. When we say we're creating something new, it, it's going to be a tough fight. It should be on our committee with us. If you, if you can make the meetings around my schedule, I would love to be. <laughs> yep. We'll work on it. Yeah, but. yeah, I mean, whatever it takes to sustain EMS services for Moffitt County is what is critical. Um, each and every one of us deserves to have an ambulance show up if we sure. call and we're in trouble. And um, that's really where, where it lies. And from that standpoint, that's where the fire district was jumping or the help Memorial Regional Health go down this route, not to say how successful it will be, uh, but the fire district will be there to assist down the road as well. If, if, the, um, if the fire district would have chosen to say, you know what, let's, let's, try, to, let's try to partner, I, I, I guess I'm agreeing with Tony that, that that philosophy probably stands better in this community, in my opinion as well. Um, and say that, okay, we, we will take you on. We, we obviously need to look at boundaries or, or service level, or I get that there's a lot of, you know, to that understanding that the fire district needs a mill increase to afford to operate. The, the fire district's not out anything, right? I mean, if it doesn't pass, you're still a fire district that does what you do. Well, it depends if we have the keys to the ambulance at that time. Well, you're not going to unless this passes, right? I mean, Correct. You're looking at, at, a, at, I guess what we're seeing is kind of our joint services. You, you know, that, that was the big uh, contentious point. If we go down this route and it doesn't pass, there's no way the district or Memorial Regional Health can continue to fund this service. But somebody's going to have to. And if we already have the keys to the ambulance, it's going to be a struggle for the district. And it, it will take the district to an, an, you know, financial situation we can't afford. Either. But nobody was asking the district to take the keys prior to knowing how it would well, shake out. I, 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 I understand. think that would be a presumed outcome. Well, and it yeah. also doesn't fix the coverage areas, because if you're in Lay, you're not covered under the fire district, and you're not in Maybell's district. So if you live in Lay, Colorado, you'd have no EMS coverage if it was just the district covering it. You'd be out of district coverage. And that, I think that's part of the problem is, is Moffitt County is such a big county that there's parts of Moffitt County that really don't have any EMS coverage. Um, we have Maybell that goes all the way up to the state line or Artesia 
when they're available. When they're available, but as far as advanced life support, the only thing it comes out of Craig. So there's a lot of these these dead areas where, like fire, the house catches on fire on County Road Four North. Who covers it? I mean, we end Craig, up, Craig covers it. Yeah, we bring Carbon County, but it's not in their district. But they so still cover it. They still cover it, and then parts of the district are in Route County, which makes it really because way EMS is directed, your dock comes out of your county. Um, the way the fire district is drawn, part of it's in Route County. So it, I can see where it would be hard to put the districts overlaying each other. I think I agree with you that it's the best financial thing is to have them, do, everybody goes to the same call, might as well be paid out of the same, same district. But the lines are what would be really interesting to draw, is to figure out how to get that EMS coverage. But that's what these feasibility studies can do, is tell us, hey, where do we draw the lines? How does this look like to, to get the best coverage from off county? And I think that those lines mean nothing really, though. To a degree, yeah. but they, they do. Because we are, we are Moffitt <clears throat> County, and we're going to well, go to Wilderness Ranch. The fire department it, just went there last week. That's, that's, you know, that's not necessarily do. true once you get west of the 60. That, right. I, I'd love to say that that's true, but there are things that happen in emergency services where it really is hard to figure out who's going to come and help you. And, and, and that's a hard part about living in, or working in Moffitt County in emergency services is there's areas that are – you're just trying to find someone to come out and do it. It's not that it's anybody's responsibility, and that's the problem, is, is nobody's responsible for that area. Sure. So, and Lay is one of those, where you, know, you do have quite a few people live in that area, and they're not covered by, by an EMS district, and they're not covered by a fire district. There are several challenges ahead, for sure. Yeah, for sure. We need to start working on that um, as soon as we can, because it's gonna take a lot, and we want a clear message to our techs um, supporters and um, I think it's going to be also a very valuable so that we can have the elevator speeches from all of us coming together from the city the county and you know the fire district on why this is the best solution and what is what is the best solution absolutely and maybe that's what will come out of this and you know, when we is coming up start this. doing the study and you start working with setting up the district boundaries you know and you start working with them the people the experts in here and they can give us a little more direction so either way we would have to do this campaign anyway with either fire district or memorial regional health and they're looking for 2021 to put it on the ballot would be the target november 2021 mm -hmm. so we would have to put this in our 2021 budget right right okay council any other questions no Yep, yes, sir. Um, is there any sort of contingency plan for if the voters don't pass the mail levy? Not at this moment. <laughs> $750,000 is hard to swallow. So if I, we can. I understand that. Um, if we can figure out a plan, yes, but we are not there yet. We are trying our best to make sure that this works. And then we'll have to go down that rabbit hole when and if it happens. But I mean, there's concern, sure. That's all I've got. Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Up next is item 6B, and that uh, Melanie Kilpatrick is here um, uh, as Executive Assistant to the City Manager to present to the Council the results of the recycling survey um, that we administered earlier this year. Good evening, Council. Mayor. I'm just going to take a few quick minutes tonight to review the results from the recycling survey that we launched uh, earlier this year. First, I need to thank Madison with the Yampa Valley Sustainability Council. She's been a great resource to the city as we were developing our survey and has offered to continue to be a resource as we move forward with decisions. For a quick recap, we launched the survey early February, gave residents about three weeks to return a response. 3,900 surveys went out via our utility billing insert, of which 179 completed surveys were returned. The survey consisted of five main questions, and I think, Katie, can you go to that link real fast? Five main questions with areas for comment and details upon those questions. <clears throat> And uh, I do also need to offer a special thanks to Colleen Brixius as she completed all the data, um, compiling the data entry for all these surveys, which really was a time saver on my behalf. So thanks to Colleen. Key takeaways from the survey, 4.6 completion rate. So it's important to note that we really have an incomplete um, 
data set here. But of those completed surveys, 86% indicated having access um, to recycling was valuable for them and they wished for it to continue. 87% indicated that they used the North Yampa facility to some capacity. 73% indicated they were willing to maintain recycling center access, although there were concerns with possible added costs from the remaining participants, as well as concerns with undefined costs moving forward. So, Peter, Trevor, Rod, and myself recently sat down to evaluate some of our potential operational expenses moving forward. It's important to note that we did calculate these expenses based on cardboard intake only. So there could be some fluctuation depending on what streams we just um, look at going forward. So facility fence would be a one-time cost, annual cost for truck driver, annual costs for fees per tonnage, marketing education and staff, brings us close to about 80,000 per year. Um, please note that that cost does not include overtime and does not include contamination fees. Contamination, um, common contaminants for cardboard might include tape, cereal boxes, staples, so really not the obvious contaminants, which is why that marketing and education piece is really important to control contamination. Possibilities as far as offsetting costs might include a dollar per month billed to our utility customers, which might bring in about 46,000 to offset costs, roughly. Just one example that we discussed recently. Lastly, I'll note that we aren't the only municipality dealing with issues with recycling and these decisions going forward. The city of Casper recently examined possibilities such as eliminating their services, limiting their services, and if they continue with services, how do they charge for those services? So this new recycling economy is really creating questions as we move forward. So do you guys have any questions? Yeah, Melanie. Um, so if, if we chose to kind of go this route, what, what level of service would this look like in, in, in your opinion? I think that would be something that Trevor, Rod, myself, and Peter would need to sit down and really flesh out some more of the costs. Right now, we're not clear whether we can take it to Maybell, whether we can take it. These calculations are based on taking it to Maybell right now. Um, if it was Steamboat, there would be an increase in costs just to cover the mileage difference there. So I think we would really need to sit down and look at what source streams might be a possibility what costs look like, and what the tipping point is for value versus costs. And you said Maybell, you meant Milner. Sorry. No, I'm just, just making sure. I'm like, there's something I don't know about out there? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, Peter, we, we spoke a little bit about this priorly, so this would be a, a fairly limited open time frame, correct, at, at the recycling plant or area up there north of town? We talked together about uh, probably the best scenario if we were to continue recycling would be to fence off that location up there, have it staffed uh, maybe 10 hours a week uh, with somebody that could make sure that the streams remain clean and that we collected single stream and in a number of different categories. And, uh, you know, if we could collect some offset fee to help uh, cover at least part of the cost of delivering that service, uh, we could probably keep up with it. And uh, but that's something we need to talk a little bit more about. Sure. I understand this is in kind of yeah. early development phases here. And we've been shut down for a while, so things may have changed east, uh, but you know we'd have to go back to those entities. And whether it's Steamboat Springs, which is where we used to take it at no charge, except for the delivery costs to and, to and from. Um, or Milner, which now has a uh, per ton charge on the tipping fee. So, so in your in your staff, uh, I'm assuming in your staff charge here, the thirteen thousand, is that would that be that that part time individual that worked ten hours a week? Is that? I think that's what is that is that what that number kind of yeah. represents? Like four hours. Okay. Roughly. Is that all we had in there? Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I think was, we were talking about maybe two. Three times a week, maybe like four hours a day. Oh, okay. So 10, 12 hours, something. Okay. 
So pretty minimal. That would also be another discussion because I think they're pretty maxed out on ability of what staff is able to do right now. So so potentially this would be a new part-time hire for the city. Mm -hmm. um, so just, just some discussions going forward. But this would be the attempt to help clean up the facility, right, and not have the contaminants Contamin in the in the recyclables. This this way we know that when we send a load, one of your drivers comes and picks it up, that somebody was there during the time we were open and we weren't having vinyl siding shoved in the the plastic or, or, or wherever it was going that, that makes it a contaminated load, right? Driving it all the way there just to bring it back. Right, right. Yeah. Bring it back or get rid of it at a higher cost. Uh, right. We, we can make sure it is what it's supposed to be this way. I, I mean, just, I just wish we would have got more surveys back. That's only 4.5% of the but, surveys that we sent. Yeah. Out. So to base all that off 4% is, that's it, tough. It, and that was my concern as well. Do sure. you think we could run... An online survey, it's easier than trying to fill out the survey, mail it back in. So that's a possibility if, if your wish is, um, we basically had to create an entry point sure, and so right. we can launch that out. It might create some duplication, but it would probably give us more, more participation. Now, if you pay your bill online, I don't know how many people are doing that now. I never even opened the utility bill and saw the survey, so. Sure. Sure. So from that standpoint, maybe it's get a little bit better response rate. And then your fee, your recovery fee of charge of $1, that would be to all solid waste customers or to people that just... All utility customers. All utility customers. So how would we capture folks in the county yeah. then that wanted to utilize this? Rod made a suggestion that perhaps we charge for vouchers that they could purchase here and then take um, and deliver to the attendant at the facility so it might be something we need to talk about further about how to capture sure. some of those costs from county residents so kind of based off what i'm seeing here that like a, a, an individual and resident in the county could get 12 vouchers for like a year's worth of vouchers for 12 bucks you could get I, i'm just it looks like a dollar a month so if you plan on trying to recycle it cost you basically a dollar a month to get rid of it and then it sounds like there would be a couple three days a week that you could get rid of the stuff however you figured out that schedule i like the concept because i know that i hate to see all that stuff that we could recycle going to the landfill at the same time it didn't make any sense to capture stuff that we were supposed to be recycling that got turned around and went to the landfill anyways and we picked up and trucked a milliner and brought back <laughs> that that's that's ridiculous right so this seems like a much better approach it is unfortunate that it's only four per 4.6% of the population. I wouldn't argue with that. So I very much like the idea of trying to get out another survey. But okay. council, I, I mean. Is there any way we could work with like the Craig Daily Press? Because I know that they have the, they used to have the online surveys all the time. And they would normally get a lot of results there. We can absolutely idea. look at that option. Sure. And the chamber might be another good option. I know they've helped us in the past get word out to people, so. I mean, recycling is a great thing. It's unfortunate that it's gotten so problematic. Right. I mean, I, I, well, I understand that. The it's education the piece. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, as important as anything else. What is recyclable, what's not? And, um, you know, cardboard, I don't know, cereal box? I, yeah. Right. <laughs> I, you know, I so education that. is huge. And uh, I'm, I'm with the mayor on the standpoint it's ridiculous to haul waste back and forth because it's contaminated. And if we can't clean up the contamination, it makes no sense. So well, stuff as simple as like the plastic flyer, like ACE flyers or whatever you see in the paper yeah. contaminates. Magazine covers, oh, anything that's gotcha. glossy, gotcha. Yeah. can't be accepted for paper. So it, I mean, it's more than just citing being like the obvious of stuffing in there. Right, it's right. those little fine tuned details that need to be you know. You might have to hold an education class for council. I shouldn't speak <laughs> for everybody. Sorry, I would not have known that. I think that. that's where the um, source separation, it, we would need to delineate how how to accept. We talked about how many receptacles we have and um, maybe the co-mingling makes it more complicated and more risk for contamination. So all things we can look at going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate the effort on it. Um, I know that I know this has been a lot of work on this side, a lot of extra work. Um, the nice part to me is if we we've been doing this at a seventy to eighty thousand dollar a year loss for how long now? I, I, I mean, I, I remember Randy talking yeah, about it. Randy, 
estimated it at 60. But, okay. But then when they started charging the per ton fee, it went up to 80,000. But this has been going on for several years, right? Yeah. That we've been absorbing this cost. Well, and the biggest issue, the reason we had to go that route is because the commodity prices on cardboard, for instance, which is the biggest stream, dropped 70%. And so nobody wants to sort recyclables when you're when you when you have just 30 percent of what you used to get for the product and and spend all, expend all that labor trying to separate it and okay. clean it up so so they quit taking it for the most part well I would guess that before we do any further efforts as far as another survey or anything maybe we should the first thing we should probably find out is if Milner or Steamboat is actually going to take yeah. clean recyclables right I mean it, it, it's feel I feel like we've got a a fairly good system figured out that, that we could probably offer clean recyclables now, having it manned and fenced, and we don't just get random stuff showed up. Um, but I, but I would it would make sense, I guess, to make sure that we have a place we could get rid of this before we move much further. Keeps it out of, out of the landfill. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. So we'll do a little bit more work on our end, and then um, depending on the feedback that yeah. we're getting, we'll examine whether that survey launch is, is needed. Absolutely. A digital survey. Thank you. Thank you for all the work you did do. Yeah, thank you. Sorry to put more work on you. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, up next is seven, our consent agenda. Excuse me, consent agenda. We have one item, and that's approval of renewal of a fermented malt beverage liquor license to Mini Mart Incorporated DBA Loaf and Jug, uh, number 869, located at 242, no, I'm sorry, 2441 West Victory Way. Craig, no reason shown for denial. Normally, we would probably ask Bruce or Liz if they had anything, but it says no cause shown for denial. We don't request that anyone be here, and I don't see anyone I can think of that's from Loaf and Jug. So, mm. Council, what would be your pleasure? I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the renewal for Loaf Mini Mart Loaf and Jug. Reason being, no cause for denial. Second. Okay. Motion was made by Councilman Nichols, seconded by Councilman James, to approve the renewal of the fermented malt beverage liquor license to Mini Mart Incorporated DBA Loaf and Jug, uh, located at 2441 West Victory Way. Um, Liz, would you pull the council, please? Councilman Nichols? Aye. Councilwoman Cam? Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. Councilman Hamp? Aye. Councilman James? Aye. Councilman Aye. Mayor Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Okay, up next is uh, item eight, our public hearing. So we will enter into public hearing, and this is to hear um, ordinance number 1110-2020, an ordinance of the City of Craig for the City of Craig, Colorado, amending a portion of Chapter 3.04 of the Craig Municipal Code concerning sales tax collection. And I'm told that Katie is here for her big debut to explain this to council and the rest of everyone else. Good luck, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so basically this is just some language updating so that we um, maintain uh, the standard definitions that the state of Colorado has made some changes to with the Wayfair ruling and the change to marketplace facilitators, that kind of thing. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to read here. So, no, no, that's okay. Just, just a brief explanation. So, this, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is just this is just keeping up with the changing times in tax collection code, if you will. Yeah. So, the state of Colorado is going to be rolling out um, a uniform collection system that we're going to be participating in, mm -hmm. so that vendors that sell across the state can report and remit their sales tax in one location. So as such, we have to have the standard definitions in place and adopted for us defining the sales tax. So this is just some language change. Okay. And, and, and before with, because you said this was alluding to like the Wayfair, the Amazon stuff, right? The online sales. Um, it was like they were self-reporting or something like that at, at, at first or? Voluntary. Voluntary, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this gives us kind of this a little more teeth in it, the state saying yes. this is how you report now. Yeah, now that it's going to be a one-stop shop, essentially, for reporting, it will take the burden, per se, out of it for the reporters to go to each jurisdiction and report separately. Well, 
Okay. And this is also pertaining to collecting sales tax off of internet sales, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the Wayfair, the Amazon, yeah. See, Paul, that's the nice part. We can ask these questions. We make it sound like we're trying to make sure the public knows what's going on. Really, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> no, I just gave it away. So. I'm unfortunately familiar with this one. <laughs> good, good. Okay, Council, any further questions for Katie? It might be a while before we see her at Council again, so <laughs> don't let her off easy. Well, we got public, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Also, in a public hearing, just so I don't forget, if anyone in the audience, um, or I guess if we have anybody out there virtually, this is your opportunity to speak for or against this topic. So I guess I need to give you that option to do so. Now, right? This is where we need the Jeopardy music, I swear. It would just be... <laughs> Okay, so that uh, hearing that there is no further comments, we're going to move out of the public hearing and back into the regular council meeting. Katie, thank you very much. And that moves us to item 9A, and that is our second reading for ordinance number 1110-2020, an ordinance of the City Council for the City of Craig, Colorado, amending a portion of Chapter 3.04 of the Craig Municipal Code concerning sales tax collection. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we... Approve ordinance number 1110-2020, second reading. Second. Okay, the motion was made by Councilman Boyer, seconded by Councilwoman Camp to approve ordinance number 1110-2020, second reading. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Liz, would you please poll the council? Councilman Nichols? Aye. Councilwoman Camp? Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. Aye. Nay. Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Up next is item 9B, and that is an introduction to ordinance number 1111 2020, an ordinance updating the residential and commercial collection fees. Trevor, I believe we're looking to you for this for some input. Yeah, in a nutshell, you can see the highlighted changes in the For the 90-gallon cans, as you're all probably aware, we were picking them up for free extra pickups, and we wanted to make sure it was noted that all extra pickups for 90-gallon cans by the automated truck um, starting August 1st will incur a $5 fee, um, as well as Anything that's going to require a manual pickup, the rear load, if someone, if we need to take two guys over there and pick up a couch or pick up a bundle of leaves or, or sticks, whatever it may be, we'll incur a $15 charge per pickup. And this is to help cover, cover costs that we were eating as the enterprise. Um, so... That's what that piece is regarding. And then we wanted to, we've been getting a lot of 300 gallon cans out on the streets. We've actually used our first uh, 20 cans that we purchased this year. They've already been all sent out to customers. And we wanted to get that updated in the ordinance for what the rate was going to be for those cans, as well as updating the cost for the construction dumpsters. The, Two, three, four, and six. Um, I thought, Katie, didn't we? That's what spurred this whole change. To the updating these costs was they were billed monthly, and we were losing all of our construction dumpsters, and we had a backup uh, list of people wanting to get these dumpsters, but we don't have any. So. Uh, there were, there were several things that kind of prompted this, but one was the free extra pickup that we were doing because of the start with the um, COVID where we didn't want um, our refuse employees handling the, the trash, you know, so we started doing that free extra pickup every week. Um, we don't want to go back to picking up the extra bundles 
per se for free. They used to do that as a courtesy. Um, and then we've had a huge shortage of construction dumpsters this summer. Um, we do allow people to, it's per dump payment and people can keep them up to a month for one payment. And so everybody was home. I mean, summer is our busiest time anyway, but everybody was home. And so I think they'd get them and they'd <laughs> procrastinate their projects because they knew they had a month. So we wanted to change the timing of the construction dumpsters to be for a maximum of two weeks per payment. But then when we started looking at that, it's like, well, why are two and three yard dumpsters the same price? Why are four and six yard dumpsters the same price? It didn't make any sense where everybody went to get six yards because it's the same price as a four yard, you know? Um, so we didn't increase the price on any of them. Well, I guess the six yard went up $5, but the others, we just reduced the price so it was measurable based on how many yards they had to the price difference between them. So that way people are actually looking at what size they need. You know, help free up dumpsters. You know, it didn't make sense for us to go out and buy a bunch more dumpsters at ten to twenty thousand dollars and then we'll be inundated with them again once they'll come back. So this is kind of a way to help evenly distribute the cost per yard and collect some revenue for these different items. Yeah, yeah. And just make all the changes all at once so it's not keep changing in the future and, you know, okay. roll so out a new we plan. Not, so we're not going to do the curbside pickup before the trash comes anymore on their weekly pickup. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Reason being, we were asked to look at some cost-saving scenarios and, and COVID kind of forced this new routine upon the refuse department. And it is actually surprisingly working well. And I sat down our department, talked to all the guys, and because we we had there was going to be issues, people are going to have complaints. We know that. But from the business standpoint, surprisingly, the tonnage is going up in the automated because people are better utilizing those cans. There's actually less stuff on the curbs. It's cleaned up town significantly, and. Uh, People, people are better utilizing their cans. I mean, they can still put sticks and leaves and whatever they need to in their can. And we've been doing the extra pickup for free as a kind of a benefit to the community, but we've had to make a decision going forward here and decided that, that actually that five dollar fee was in this ordinance already. So um, that isn't anything new, but we wanted to highlight it. So that's something you're going to continue to do on, on any given week, any resident with the dumpster can call after you they, you've picked up their trash and say, I feel that I need you to come yeah, clean it up again. 24 hours notice, we'll still go make sure we go get their A second run. For a $5 fee, or if they have- Oh, for $5. Yeah, that's it. I guess my, my, my heart, my problem with this is that the city shouldn't be in business to make money and to push out other businesses um, that are trying to make a living. That's not the city's job. And so we, we went and when, the other sanitation companies came in. We, you know, had this competitive argument to try to see what we can do to keep our customers because we knew we were going to give them a better service. I mean, to me, I, to, to take away something and then charge them something when we're, we're, that's part of why you're paying sales tax. That's why you're part of doing this. Unless we're telling them, hey, the sanitation department is losing two people because we're not going to do this extra pickup anymore because that was two people's job. So now that we're the reason that we're doing this is because we can't keep the staff. I get that. I, that's part of so, business. But to help clarify, too, uh, we work overtime on Saturdays every week. And our goal is to get rid of that Saturday route so our guys aren't working overtime every week. And with this COVID, we've recognize we're able to free up that rear load truck and another hand and be able to get rid of our overtime on Saturday and give our guys time off because a lot of times they're working six days a week they can move that Saturday day route to Thursday because we have more time now and and like I was saying people are better utilizing their cans so I mean they're they're still uh, they're still getting the service and I 
So is the labor load, is it's with the manual pickup is where the, the labor load. It's not with the automatic, not with the automatic pickup. So like if someone puts their can out twice a week and you guys go ahead and pick it up, what's, is it fairly nominal or how much added well, expenses it's a, it's actually take? It's an efficiency thing, you know, say right now we're getting about 80 extra pickups a week, free ones. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you have your regular route, you know, you're running about 600 cans per day for the automated. And when you have those free cans, not making any revenue and it's messing up our schedule and you're having to dart all over town it makes it difficult to be efficient Agreed. as well as try to get rid of mm -hmm. overtime um, in the weekend but the sanitation department over the last seven years has not lost any money right okay and so um, it's always it's always has a healthy deal and it's always been one of those things that we we've, we've just kind of done so I guess my, my the only way that I would I, I think this is okay is that everybody that's on the list for snow plowing, all our elderly people, there's no way we're charging them $5 because we need to go pick up some stuff. Like there has to be an exception in here, in my opinion, that disabled, you know, elderly, that they're, whoever's on the um, snow plow list that we plow their garage, you know, their sidewalk and stuff, I, I feel like there has to be something here that, um, we're not just doing so the, the $5 has always been in this ordinance. But we've never charged it. We haven't charged it. That's yeah, no, that's not true. We did charge the $5 up until COVID started. We did charge the $5 for extra pickup on. Right. But they didn't. The only reason we did that is because we were going to their house twice on the same day. One with a truck that would pick up everything next to their dumpster. Right. And one that the truck automated truck came. They came to their house twice a week anyway. Well, on the twice same on the day, same, on the same right. day, they came to the house twice. And we ended that service and said that due to COVID, we're not handling your trash. Well, it, was a, it was a health issue and a safety issue. You know, I, I get it. Guys picking up yeah. You get a crew of 100 pounds full of last weekend's beer and rotten chicken. You know, it, you want to help protect our guys. I understand that part. Right, but that's the reason we cut the $5 is because we were going to their house twice. Anywhere on the same day, we were going yeah, there twice that's, for that's the same exactly price. Right. And since we started this in COVID, from what I understand, we've we've our schedule has gotten better. We haven't had to work those Saturdays, right? Even though we've doing right yeah half a day, right? Yeah. yeah day. Even though we've got these roughly eighty extra pickups a week, correct? Yeah. That on average, yeah. sure. Well, I had a couple questions, Trevor. Number one. Uh, you see, uh, you cut out the 15% uh, reduction for signing a uh, commercial contract. You might be able to answer that better, but I, I believe the reason being was to help be more consistent with billing. Because it gets pretty crazy when you... Well, that 15%, they took out the language on the contract for to be only for a year so that they weren't having to redo contracts every single year. Right. Um, so then, and with that, I think that was part of it too. Um, it is a tracking administrative nightmare. I've had a little bit of <laughs> transition in our department over the last couple of years. Um, so it is a very manual process to track those. You can't just say we're going to give this account a 15% discount that expires on this date within the system. You know. Um, and then the uh, $15 fee for manual pickup. Is there any limit to that? I've seen... Couches, dressers, tires. Well, the, I know tires you're tires you're charging for, charge, but, you know, but I've seen so much stuff piled beside the road. You know, is is there a limit to that or? Well, I mean, kind of the uh, rods this at rods discretion. There's an ordinance. I don't remember what the number is offhand. That says that limbs need to be bundled, leaves need to be in bags, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, if they have a pile of just loose trash at the end of their driveway. They're not going to pick that. Yard roll off dumpster, and I've seen that a lot. But couches and chairs. Couch it. We'll come get a couch. We'll come get a chair. We'll come get a fridge, and that's also mentioned. A fridge too. Oh. Okay. Um, and we actually increased that rate. Reason being, we were cheaper than local businesses, and we didn't want to compete with. For one, we were not in business to go pick up fridges because you got to drain the free on and so forth, and we didn't want to compete with local business. It's actually raising our price to. 90 makes us more expensive than a local business who takes care of that service. So that was the reason for that. But we will do it. 
Well, the local businesses were cherry picking accounts by signing contracts and asking for and offering discounts. Um, you know, I like the city in competition with some local businesses too, because I had a uh, commercial account where the big boys, you know, waste management came in and bought out the two little independents, and um, and then my trash bill tripled. You know, as soon as they were the only game in town, so I, I, I like that the city and the city provides a better service. You know, I looked at last month's financial st uh, statement for the solid waste department, and we're up 6.5% in revenue over a year over year. So, you know, for budget, we're flat, but we're up in revenue. So I'm I, I just unsure why we were doing this right now at this time. Also, when we're talking about if we want people to recycle, we're going to charge everybody a buck there, too. So um, I'm not sure if this is the right time. Yeah, I'm having a, I'm having a hard time with with the five dollars. I guess I guess to back to Tony's point, um, we we asked for a tax increase to maintain services in the city, and I, I just and we and it traditionally have always done the 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 extra pickup. I guess with the loose trash, which I know was potentially overutilized by citizens, but it was nonetheless it was there and available. I understand the safety standpoint from the COVID and probably less work comp claims from young men or older men out there trying to pick up these coolers full of rotten chicken and beer. I get that. <laughs> um, but I, but I don't know that I can support the additional $5. I mean, we're, we're facilitating it right now. The extra pickups that come in. Um, I would, I would personally probably feel better if we didn't do that, that portion of it. I get the refrigerators because mm -hmm. it, we were charging 50 priorly or, or currently. And so we're we're losing money to do it, then to get rid of it, evac for eighty, right? I mean, I understand that, right? Totally understand that. Um, I guess that's my two cents worth on, on that. I'm all for charging if they're when you go pick up a couch. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all I'm all for charging that. Like that, yeah, I have no problem with yeah. that. But when you can run an automated truck there grab it and dump it for somebody. I, I, I have a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. Anything you got to go hand move, I have no problem. Hey, it's you're going to pay the dump or we're going to come and get it for you and you got to pay us a fee. I, mm -hmm. I, I totally get that. Yeah, because uh, you put that couch in your truck, it's $10 at the landfill, right? Yeah, no matter what. So you're what. paying for the convenience for our guys to come by and yeah. pick it up and take it to the landfill for us. It has to be worth your while. I just, Absolutely. The automated truck thing is where I have the mm -hmm. problem with. The five bucks, I just... And I could, I mean, we could discuss that. We actually did discuss not charging that fee and that fee was in that ordinance like i mentioned right um, it, right so we'd actually have to omit that fee. or we just don't so charge it like we've been doing. another thing to consider yeah, with that up. though if we don't charge for that extra pickup people aren't going to want bigger cans if they truly need them you know if the the customers that have 300 gallon cans they're they're not going to sign up for that service because they can get a 90 gallon can and get a free extra pickup every week this is something that they've only been experiencing for the last couple months with the free extra pickup each week. Um, the calls right now are routed to Rod because we couldn't handle the volume in my office with scheduling all that stuff. So there are some logistical things that would have to be worked out with that as well. Just some extra information. <laughs> sure. Yeah, at the end of the day, is logistics and, and scheduling and not being efficient with the department you're kind of bouncing around but maybe you could offer the extra pickup once or twice a month That's on a scheduled basis like if you if you so it's not such a logistical nightmare if you're a provider and within 30 days you can get an extra pickup and then after that there's a bill on that because I, I think i can I'm, I'm with tony on this I, I have a hard time supporting even though it's already in ordinance so that they charge right. the five dollars how do you, and then uh, there's the tracking of that though too it has <laughs> to do with the, yeah how do you how do you make the logistics work out to where you're not right. creating man hours to do work that we're creating because we're actually not charging um, I and mean, that would be a lot of work in our office to track all that and say okay well you had your one now you're gonna have to you know pay the extra fee for it and can't you yeah. just set up like a spreadsheet in QuickBooks or something and we could buy tablets once for the guys in the truck and then they log it, right? And it could be set up every month. I mean, that's how I do my cash flow every, every month. You know what I mean? So like that one-time expense and then you could easily go through and just 
log where they've been, <coughs> right? I mean, I don't know, is that too... <coughs> I mean, I guess it kind of involves my guys, but... Question. <coughs> You know, I mean, because then it, you know, you could compile all that information as they're going through there. It's still a manual process as far as tracking it and getting it on bills and all of that. <coughs> I'm sure, we could we could get a process in place, absolutely, but it's still more hours. How have we been doing it for the last yeah. four months at 80 extra pickups a week? The calls have been going to Rod, and we're, still doing and we're not charging, right? At all. We're, there's not tracking. We're not looking to see if people have had more than one a week, essentially. We're just telling people you can have one a week. The calls are going to Rod. He puts them on a schedule. And I think, I mean, sometime you, there could be a little bit of trust. And obviously there's always going to be somebody that abuses it. Sure. I, I get it. Right, what we do. Um, but at the same time, I mean, trust people too, you know, that, hey, we're doing one a week free if you need it. I mean, 80 out of how many dumpsters do we have? Yeah. About 3,000. What's that percent? Yeah, that's right. Right. Eighty out of three thousand is is a very small number. Now, if you get up to you getting a thousand extra a week, or you getting five hundred extra a week, of course I get. We can't we can't do that. And to your point, of those eighty, they seem to be reoccurring people taking advantage of the free service, and that's why we we discussed this in depth. For sure. And it's only eighty people, so. If we charge them five dollars, it's not affecting the majority of of our uh, customers. So when you say you're not really tracking them, you are kind of because now you're saying that it seems to be repeat offenders. We'll have so people, to speak. We'll have people that will call and say, "Well, I don't want to call every week. Just put me on the schedule for the next four weeks. I'll have an extra pickup on this day. You know that kind of thing." It cuts down um, on phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Good thinking, Paul. <laughs> We just see the positive and everything. Yeah, we're we're like we're about two point seven five percent of all of our uh, customers are 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 asking for an extra pickup. And I exactly and I what think what you're saying right now is that the reason we decided to charging the five dollars going back to it would be okay because it's not affecting it's affecting the repeat. When we charge the five dollars, except we're touchdown. taking away for good the second pickup that everybody's had for twenty years. We did that because of COVID, and we said, you get two pickups a, month, a week, they're both free, or you're paying for them. But COVID came, we can't do that one. But unless we're living under COVID's rules for the rest of our days, then I, get, then I understand. But until that, we are taking away one pickup and charging them $5 for what we used to do for free. I, I mean, just the way it is, I don't understand how we, that, no, that's we're not happening. Right? You're getting rid of the rear load and still give them the opportunity to get stuff picked up. But like to what you alluded to, we're going to pick it up, but either we get charged to go deliver it or they get charged to go take it to the landfill. Um, I do understand we're getting rid of that service. It was a free service, but... Um, it was in their monthly bill. They're yeah, tw I mean, $22 a month you were getting whatever you can pile up into your driveway picked up, basically. And a lot of that, a lot of times, a lot of that stuff probably should go in a six-yard dumpster. You know, it's Rod's discretion. Yeah. Peter, is it um, appropriate to have a question or comment from the audience during during this? Is that I just want to make sure before I had a hand out there. Is that is that a? I think it's up to you. But is that? Yeah. yeah okay. I just trying to follow rules. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no problem. I just wanted to ask. Sorry. I'm going to identify myself. <laughs> Thank you. Jenny Morley, 636 Taylor Street. I am one of those people that had four 55-gallon cans in the alley. I would fill up my automated can, and during the summer, all four of those cans would be full of either grass clippings, cuttings from my garden. I love to garden. Since this has started, I think I've only had to call for an extra pickup twice. But y'all are forgetting two very important things. Neighbors will network. Instead of calling the city for an extra pickup, I ask my neighbor, do you got room in your can? And they say, sure, and I throw it in there. So I'm saving the city an extra pickup. And I think more importantly than the cost savings is your liability. When you've got people hand picking up trash and you never know what's in that bag, people will throw glass in there, sharp metal. All it takes is one of those guys to pick up something that's heavy 
and it brushes against their body and they've got a leg cut open. I think for the safety of the employees, you've got to put something in place that if people want to do that or use it in excess, as a resident, I actually support the extra $5 charge. Okay, thank you. If I can do it, everybody else can network. Sure. Thanks. And I, I don't believe there's any question in whether or not we're hand picking up trash anymore. I, I don't believe that's gonna happen. I, I think moving forward, we're getting away from that model, correct? I, it's just way more efficient. Absolutely, and safer. I, yes, we do, absolutely. Thank you for that. So council, um, there's no need for a motion on an introduction, um, but any further questions or mm. comments or direction for Katie and Trevor and those working on the ordinance? You think that the commercial discount will put you at a disadvantage with your competition though? Eliminating that? For the one year? Yeah. That's on new, I mean, that was on new accounts and we don't have a whole lot of new commercial accounts getting set. I don't think that okay. um, it would be a real significant impact. I think it was just more cleaning up the language and doing it all at once when we were addressing it, looking at how it was written currently and what needed to be addressed and changed and updated. Um, I, didn't I don't see know that that was new, a new accounts on. I didn't either. It says commercial accounts, commercial. So if you have an existing commercial account, you still get your discount the way you said that? Well, they're not renewing the contracts every year was part of, I think, because it was for one year, is that correct? Right. Yeah, so yeah. 12 months. 12 months, yeah. One and that was because it was, yeah, re-signing contracts every year, which is something they wanted to do away with. <coughs> with. Paperwork nightmare. We were continuing their service, but we weren't actually getting a lot of customers' signatures on these pieces of paper. I, mean, I remember Rod used to come around and get my signature mm -hmm. once a year. <laughs> so one specific yeah. example I guess I'm curious about is the school district. I sign a contract every year for, for, with Rod, generally speaking. Actually, we sign two. We have a summer contract because there's so much less trash being generated, right? Um, and, then, and then the school year itself. So how does, how does a customer like that, are, are we losing a discount in this? No, because you, yours actually is a little bit different. Oh, okay. Discount written in on your contract that you're signing As a, year. Got it. Okay. So. Okay. It's still something that can be built in. Um, depending on, you know, what Rod works out with those customers. I know Got it. It's more of like a mass accounts kind of discount. Okay, sure. Um, there's so many different accounts with the school district. Sure. Any other questions, Council? Nope. I was just going to point out, so I think in paragraph B, that first line, I think it has to be effective the August 1st of 2020 for the attached feature. Because the attachment. Yep. Okay. Just point that out. That means we'd have to have a special meeting to run this through properly. Yeah, because this yeah, is only the introduction, right? The introduction and first the and second. second reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. For landfill fees or collection fees. Eight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. August 11th before we finish this up. Yeah. Un unless we held a special meeting for the purpose of going through yeah, I wouldn't I, yeah, necessarily I recommend doing that. I think yeah. it's not my suggestion either. We, had, we already had a special meeting. This doesn't seem like that important, right? <laughs> well, we can change, certainly, change yeah, I think we can postpone it. It was more, I think, they wanting to eliminate that Saturday route to eliminate the overtime for the department. Yeah. And to do that, we need to try to address some of the other things that are mm -hmm. scheduling troubles with that. And the extra pickup is one of them. When we charge for that extra pickup, you know, we get maybe one or two a day when we charge the $5 for an extra pickup on the 90-gallon can. So that's a huge free up of time. Okay. You want to get those guys home. What's that? So I just want to get those guys home on the Right. Much more discussion later. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, but I think getting rid of the overtime is probably not bad. Yeah, Absolutely. That work-life balance has to be Well, there. if you can get rid of the overtime, you're sh definitely showing... A reduction there. So. Okay. Anything else, Council? Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay, up next will be um, item 9C, and that is the introduction of Ordinance Number 1112 2020, 
an ordinance amending section 13.32.020 of the Craig Municipal Code to eliminate references to double capital investment fees for unincorporated areas. Peter or Marlon, either one. Okay, I'll just give you a couple of quick things here. As you know, uh, the chloramine project uh, was ne necessitated by the fact that we have limited usage within the distribution system and we have an oversized system for the uh, for the amount of usage that we currently have and so chloramine reduces our disinfection byproducts uh, using monochloramine and uh, also keeps our chlorine residual at the necessary levels right mark and um, so we've had a few requests and I'll let Marlon talk about this ordinance but uh, we've had a few requests uh, for both residential and commercial use in unincorporated areas to tap on and our current ordinance uh, requires double tap fees and so we're asking to to change that so Marlon you want to give some background on that yeah hello council so uh, basically uh, we've had it in our ordinance for quite some time that um, um, yeah anything out of city limits was a uh, double charge for tap fees so uh, essentially if you're in town for water and sewer tap for let's say a one inch just a standard residential one inch or commercial but um, it's six thousand six hundred and sixty dollars to tap into the water and sewer uh, so obviously that makes it thirteen thousand three hundred and twenty in the county regardless if you are putting in a single family residence or you know anything you're putting a one inch tap to obviously that increases substantially if you get to one and a half two inch tap or anything like that it uh, increases most taps you find typically are the are one inch but uh, um, so um, we've had a person or two that uh, didn't quite fit into their budget and uh, one guy uh, was out uh, the other side of Shadow Mountain Clubhouse and has a business there and needing to get water and sewer to the building he's leasing them um, and um, me and Peter spoke and we we couldn't give just one person a break without you know favoritism kind of so we uh, uh, we got to looking at it thinking that uh, uh, possibly since it's a fairly limited amount anyhow that maybe we uh, uh, we do away with the double tap fee for uh, for county uh, I know some of it probably sparked because we have a lot of lines out in doe run areas and stuff, so there's a little more maintenance possibly for not a lot of usage. Um, but um, currently we have 279 water taps in Cray or in that are county water taps. Majority of them, of course, are Shadow Mountain. So in the last five to ten years, we're getting maybe one or two county taps a year. So either way, it's not a ridiculously huge amount of taps however if we get a little bit more water usage the first person I talked to was Mark to see if he was okay with it and at the time he's better for the system really better for the system. yeah better for the system so um, you know and so uh, but you lose a little on the tap fee end of things so that's that's kind of what we uh, what we come up with that it might be best to just uh, um, amend the ordinance and, uh, and and write that portion out of it and a standard tap fee would just be the same uh, whether you're within the city limits or not now the uh, monthly water rates are they're not quite double but essentially there there's a there's a higher water rate for the county right. that will stay the same so the water rates will continue will continue to be more than when you're inside the city limits why is that that's always been that way too it's an extra because you're outside the uh, the city limits you're considered you're helping to pay for that infrastructure being out that far. So that's kind of why the double the tap fee, the capital investment fee were per, per spot uh, put into place. Uh, that is also, you know, everything has to do with expansion of the treatment plant if needed. But since we have so much capacity at the plant right now, we really don't need to add to that. We just need to have a lot of customers. Yeah. And, and a lot of the ones he's talking about are, are mostly primary like dough run and just water. Residents, yeah. Sewer in that area at all, anyhow. So it's just going to be water which I need to use in some of those areas. So that is mm. But the water rates, monthly rates being higher, a lot of it's because you might have a mile of line you're taking care of with not that many customers on it. You know, as we're in the city, you're, you know, you have a lot more customers on the same, same amount of line. So, uh, so this, the rate, the monthly rates would stay same as they are now, which is increased from city, but, uh, um, but just the tap fees themselves for that initial investment to, uh, uh, to get something built would uh, would be backed off to just a regular tap fee. It would be nice to see some commercial property on, the, on some of those. It may encourage some more activity. Yeah. yeah. That would be nice to see. 
And, so. and it would shy him away from a three inch stat. If you look at the price of three inch stat, 27,000. Yeah. Double that. Jeez. Yeah. yeah uh, it would shy people away. Yeah. To say the least. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, it, it's, it's only common sense, and unfortunately, we haven't done this sooner. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's nice to see us talking about lowering the price. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally agree. Right? The cost of living here, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's really cool. Absolutely. And it might be an economic development exactly. piece, right? I mean, it's right. a, developers might look at, oh, hey. And a little here, a little there, you know. Yeah. If one right. place, I mean, uh, you know, when you when you start putting numbers together to go get financing, every yeah. every, every seven thousand dollars adds up. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Sure. Very costly. Well, I know in, when, I, when I brought this to Peter to, and Marlon to talk about the guy in, in Shadow Mountain, it was, it was the point that if you, we can't do it, we got to go to, we're going to go to Rangeley. Like, yep. well, it's just Make like, or break. It, it was a deal breaker. Yep. Not for the company that was coming from outside here, but for the landowner here that was renting it out to the guy. I was right. like, man, I'm already tapped out. And for us working for him, we brought a company from outside of Craig. Mm -hmm. To Craig, and it's just well, that's costly just to get the water and sewer hooked up because this obviously these rates don't have. That's not for us to hook anything up hardly. I mean, we put the little whip in for sure. the water, but uh, you know, it's an expensive endeavor to just to get the water in. You know, it isn't like it's for sixty six sixty. You have water and sewer. You still have to pay to put it in and everything else. So right. that starts adding up. You can have twenty thousand dollars in some before you even start pushing dirt around. You know, just to get, get you to this. To this. I appreciate your No, yeah, I appreciate there, There's no legal issues with changing this, right? Uh, <laughs> no city residents paid, you know, by, you know, it's extending something outside the city or nope. No, I don't see any. Okay. Cool. We still have agreements with the outside the city with, with the depending on how water use. We have to make them sign a sign a water agreement saying if their water is ever tested and there's an issue with uh, residual chlorine amounts being too low, it's on them to get a chlorination. We had another person in. talk to me. He said they talked to you about city water and you were trying to work on do you another one. Yeah. That's a, is that. Okay. And then there's also an annexation agreement if you do want well city water, <laughs> water and sewer, or just water. Uh, you sign an annexation agreement, basically stating that if that if if um, if anybody applies for an annexation, you're basically you're good for it. You're on board that it will be annexed. Oh, uh, if you have city. So okay. those are two agreements that, uh, that makes me feel better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So most of them don't mind signing that. They just don't like to pay the extra almost seven thousand dollars. No, I, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> that hurts. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. Okay, up next is item 9D, and that is appointment of Jay Kramer as municipal court judge for the city of Craig. I'm assuming this goes tether. Okay. So we were able to, um, Peter and I were able to sit down and meet with uh, Mr. Kramer. We went over an employment contract with him. Um, I don't see that it's been signed as of yet, um, but my understanding is that Mr. Kramer is um, happy with what's been offered. We were able to negotiate um, a monthly salary of $2,250. Um, it's a two-year contract, as we discussed in the special meeting. Um, and otherwise, I think Mr. Kramer's here and he's ready get, to get started. And I think Mr. Kramer and the mayor and um, the city clerk needs to sign the contract and we'll be ready to go. Okay. I promise I've not been dragging my feet, and I apologize, Mr. Cranmer. I, mm -hmm. I think I said Cranmer. Sorry. <clears throat> sure, absolutely. That'd be great. <clears throat> Thank you. Jay, would you like to come up and say anything, or? No? <laughs> you might as well come up and introduce yourself. <laughs> so, I'm Jay Cranmer. Answer any questions anyone has, but um, happy to get started. Yeah, no, we're we're uh, we're glad to have you on board. Those uh, have we have we looked at? Um, I guess you would probably know. I, I maybe as well as Heather have, uh, the the schedule for court. Have we decided if we're going to try to so, meet less or? Well, we can't do that when we start. Okay. And, you know, we're a court of law, and so we're still, 
at the discretion of the chief judge in um, Denver. And so right now he's pushed back, I think, in court person or in person appearances for court to September 7th, I think is the date. Oh, okay. It keeps moving. Um, it was supposed to be August 4th, I think last date before that um so anyways uh gail and i and and jay are coming in tomorrow we're going to talk about setting up some zoom um capability since the city already has that and um try to address court i think starting uh the first part of august maybe even we're scheduled right now for tomorrow um but we've dispoed a lot of those cases um so really i think we could probably start with the zoom meetings um as soon as gail can get those notices out okay so excellent Council, anything else? No. All right. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Happy to be here. Yep. We have to make yes, a motion. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, let's do that then. I guess it should be official. <laughs> Looking for a motion. <laughs> well, I'll make a motion that the Craig City Council, City of Craig, hereby employs Jay Kramer as a municipal judge per the term of the agreement on the contract bef before us. Is that good enough? Yeah. <laughs> okay, the motion was made by Councilman Nichols, seconded by Councilman James, to uh, hereby uh, employ um, as slash appoint Mr. Jay Cranmer uh, as a municipal judge um, to be the municipal court judge for the city of Craig uh, uh, with the compensation in terms of set forth in the agreed upon agreement. Fair enough? Yep. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, Liz, oh, did you have something? No. Sorry. Liz, would you pull the council, please? Councilman Nichols? Aye. Councilwoman Sands? Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. Councilman Hamm? Aye. Councilman James? Aye. Councilman Lucas? Aye. Mayor Ogden? Aye. Um, motion is successful. Thank you, sir, and welcome aboard officially. Sorry. <laughs> How do do we do it now? Okay, all right. Glad to do so. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't blame you. Okay. Probably been waiting for that for a week, right? <laughs> Thank you, sir. And he's agile. Man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Number two. Yeah. And not good, right? Okay, item, item 9E, um, discussion and action to facilitate uh, 17500 into the City of Craig 2021 budget to match funding from Moffat County Memorial Regional Health and Craig Rural Fire District for the future of the EMS. So we've heard from Mrs. Peck. Um, I don't know if you'd like to come back up. You're more than welcome. Council, any questions or? This is something we're gonna have to do in our budget process for starting in the fall. So right. are, you, are we doing a commitment now that we're gonna I, look at it because we haven't even started the budget process? Right, I feel like that that is pretty accurate. We're, we're making the commitment that this is something we're gonna try to move forward with and put in our 2021 budget. Is that, that accurate, correct, Peter? Yeah, that's correct. But the, are we, you're wanting to start doing all the um, work work in 2021, or are we wanting to throw the ball out there to do all the surveying and the assessments and all that now so that in 2021 you're doing nothing but campaigning? Good maybe, question. I'm, maybe I'm. I mean, that would be great. I understand the commitments from everyone, and I understand the strain on everyone. So I most likely, if I get a yes that we're going to look at this and put this into our budget, we'll start at least navigating through or trying to find a good system. I mean, I don't think it's – if I get commitment, yes, then I think it's time to at least move forward. Maybe we don't start getting that work where we're paying anything out until 2021. Um, but I, I think it's time to start – investigating and evaluating is that what the county and the yeah that was gonna be my question department. how are the other commitments are they for 2021 correct yeah they're, they're funding from the, the district was 2021 mm -hmm. okay. Right. okay now obviously if something came up between now and the time that we 
adopt a budget uh, that wouldn't permit us to do this. Uh, you might have that caveat, but other, other than that, I would say you could make that, a, that commitment uh, currently to commit those dollars within the council budget for 2021 as a donation. Okay. What would council's pleasure be? Well, since I already voted from the fire district supporting it and how EMS is essential service for the community, having that available, um, and it's not practical to continue the way the funding mechanism is now, I would move that the city um, pledge, is that the right term, $17,500 to be put into the 2021 budget to promote the EMS district concept. Second. Was that, has? Yeah. Okay. I, I actually did come up with another question. We we're gonna have this guy. Yes, yes, I can, I can have that opportunity here in just a second, sir. So, no, or no. wait, wait, <laughs> we gotta wait. One second, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. Honestly, I wasn't even listening. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> On that second part. Honestly, it was obvious. <laughs> it's okay. Cool. Okay. So the motion was made by Councilman Nichols, seconded by Councilman Hess, um, to appropriate um, $17,500 in the City of Craig 2021 budget for funding towards the uh, ballot measure for the EMS district. Is that reasonable? I like how you were re rewarded. I, you know, I try to remember, but no, I, that was good. I got to ad lib a little here and there. Sorry. Um, any further discussion? Hey. <laughs> so now theoretically, if uh, this was to pass, uh, you know, we, we get the funding, it goes to the, the voters on the ballot. Uh, would this completely remove the EMS services from MRH altogether? You know, we actually have been talking a lot about that and what looks best. Um, some of the comments that came back to us was that um, MRH doesn't have great standing in the community. We are absolutely trying to change that, but they think that that's why the ballot issue may not pass, being under MRH. So with that being said, do we have an ambulance garage? Do we have ambulance, like a place where they could sleep? we can absolutely continue to do that. So that's all part of the discussion that still needs to happen. I don't know if I'm answering your question right. I think that there's still a lot of things that are up in the air. I think there's also some stuff that we're gonna have to look at financially of how we can help if that sort of stuff is already in place. Does that make sense? Yes. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> is it gonna be completely out from under MRH? That's what your question is. That's, yeah, that would, and honestly, that would be, make this probably more favorable to me as well. If so the fire department were to take over standing, all of that. It would be standing alone. If that's what an EMS district is, okay. that's what's recommended. Right. That's how it would be. A special be. district formation has their own board of directors, their own uh, state rules and regulations on budgets and reporting the budgets and planning. So. As it's a totally separate entity if it's a special district. And a lot of things could come out of that, right? Like, who owns your current um, ambulance barn? The county does. The county, okay. So, yeah. I mean, potentially that's where you stay, right? I mean, there could be in-kind land donations or, or, or right? I mean, there, there's a lot. I guess that's what the survey is going to try to figure out. And, yeah, sure. Exactly. There's just a lot of intermixing type stuff. Right. Well, and I'm, I mean, obviously, there's the the whole end game of the ambulance procedure where they end up at the hospital anyway. Correct. And I understand that as well. Um, just as far as like any of the decision making, I mean, if maybe that was placed yeah. elsewhere, uh, you know, that might actually make it more favorable. It would be in a board. So that is what we heard out of those meetings okay. that we conducted over the past five or six months. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, that did answer my question. Thank you. Sorry. No, you're good. Okay. Peter? I'd like to recommend a modification to the motion based on a contingent motion that all of these, since we're all at the front end of the budgeting process in each one of these entities, that the uh, motion 
to uh, commit that funding would be contingent upon all of these other entities moving forward with their commitments to incorporate that into their budgets for 2021. So amended. And then Ryan. Okay. <laughs> I got nothing to say. <laughs> okay, so the motion has been amended to, um, oh, I lost it. To, <laughs> yeah, to make the contingent upon all four entities moving forward with the budget appropriations in 2021. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. And seconded. Any further discussion? I'm going to ask one question, maybe Kristen. Hey. I know you've asked questions about the metropolitan areas, or the metropolitan districts. Is this part of your thinking? Mm-hmm. Um, for two separate districts for them? Um, uh, hopefully, we, we can have those discussions moving forward. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense now. Okay. That's all I have. Cool. Thank you. Hearing any more, no more further discussion. Liz, would you please pull the council? Councilman Aye. Councilwoman Chan? Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. Councilman Nance? Aye. Councilman James? Aye. Councilman Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Up next is item, um, excuse me, item 9F. Uh, review and discussion of the Charter Reviews Committee's items from the city charter that they have been working on for the November 3rd, 2020 ballot. Evening. Mayor, Evening. Council members. We I was wondering I, why you were out there. <laughs> I made the mistake of uh, letting the charter, leaving the door open slightly to the Charter Review Committee that I would be willing to represent them in presenting to you. Thank you. Yeah. And I thought maybe someone else would step up, but uh, I'm happy to be here today. Um, the Charter Review Committee has been meeting monthly. It consists of uh, four council members, a couple of staff members, including someone from the police department, um, and um, a, a couple of uh, uh, citizens also. Uh, Vicki Heiser has been uh, regularly attending. Randy Call kind of transitioned from employee to, to uh, citizen, so we're glad to keep him on the committee. So um, we've come up with four um, issues that we're presenting to the city council, and those issues are in the council packet. Um, we recognize that uh, these things, these are issues that need to go before the voters and the November election, if the council chooses to present them to the voters by adopting an ordinance that would refer the measures to the, to the um, ballot. So um, we believe uh, that the proper way to proceed is one question per issue, essentially, per charter provision. So uh, four is a pretty pretty good number. We feel like maybe it's the most that we could expect voters to, um, to digest and, and act on in one, in one election. You may, you may feel otherwise. You may feel like that number is too high. <clears throat> Ultimately, I guess, um, we as a committee are referring these measures to you or, or we're, we're presenting them to you. You'll be the ones that will, will make any decisions as far as going forward on these. But we've had a lot of uh, really good, healthy discussions during our hour and a half long sessions. Um, it's been really a great process to be part of, I can, I can tell you that. And uh, the input from various um, viewpoints is, um, is great. And it's really an important part of, um, part of the recommendations that we're making. So anyway, having said all that, uh, let's, I just want you to know that the process that we're expecting is that we'll present these um, issue pages to you tonight and to the public. Um, and then the election calendar requires that we go forward in the month of August with first reading and second reading on any ordinances that you would like to um, pass or propose concerning these issues for the ballots. So the next step would be um, any of these issues that you want to go forward, we would introduce in ordinance form. Uh, city attorney would would present would uh, prepare those, and we would move forward um, with introduction, which would involve discussion. Then first reading, the first meeting in August, second reading, the second meeting in August. Of course, discussion 
input uh, through the public in the meantime and see if we if we have some issues to present to the to the public so that makes sense to you that that's the process that we expect would happen so the first um, shall I just go forward with the issues briefly yeah and uh, this one was the most challenging, really, of the four. And we've, <laughs> even our last meeting, we kind of re redid the whole thing with the input from uh, Peter and, and Heather. So uh, essentially, we're looking at a charter provision that involves um, the re filling of vacancies um, on the city council. And we've been through that process recently and, and discovered uh, as we looked closely at this charter provision, let me let me just backtrack for a moment and and just uh, get real basic on what the charter is for everyone, uh, including the public. That the charter is our constitution in the city of Craig. It was created by a vote of the people. Um, city councils cannot change the charter. Only the people, the citizens of the city of Craig, can change the charter through a vote at an election. And so we're talking about these basic uh, fundamental um, requirements of our city of Craig government to be re reviewed and, and possibly changed by the public. So um, your job is to, pr is to ultimately present those issues to the public that we think need, need addressing. And then, the, pub then the, the citizens will vote in November on those issues whether they want to change th those things. So. Um, but usually charter issues are, are real general. We don't necessarily get super specific on, on some things. We, we kind of operate in, in general uh, principles of government for us, and then we can get specific in ordinances that go um, into the ordinance book and, and address the, the real specifics. So keeping that in mind, those are some of our uh, fundamental um, understandings as we look at, at the charter. In fact, we had uh, someone come from SIRSA a few years ago, I don't know if you remember, it was Tammy Tanui, and she came and basically said, make your charter about a page and a half. <laughs> and we've got, of course, about 25 pages. But uh, that's because there's different views on how, how um, I guess, basic those general provisions should be and then the specifics should be should be done by ordinance as you as you go through the daily process and the 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 weekly process monthly process of of uh, leading the city through by the city council so anyway um, the first issue is vacancies on the city council and we saw <coughs> a couple of things in our in the objective ob objectives at, here says we want to change the term of the appointed council member to the remaining term of the vacated seat. We have this issue where um, when someone resigns from the city council, we end up with um, a very short period of time where they're appointed until the next general election and it throws off the balance of the city council. So we can end up with, at the next election, um, more than three council seats that are available uh, for uh, for filling by the voters at the election. So then we have to kind of, and then the the ultimate imbalance would be if we ended up with five or six council seats in the same election and ended up whitewashing the whole city council and starting without any experience and and with the possibility of of not maintaining uh, balance throughout uh, throughout the governing process. So anyway, we'd like to resolve this issue of, of imbalance by changing um, possibly the um, provision of the charter to uh, make the appointment for the remainder of the term. The second is that we change the election requirement to be the next November election. Um, oh, did, did we change that at the last? I thought we had changed that so that uh a councilman that was appointed at the beginning of a four-year term would not serve an entire four-year term, thereby depriving the electorate the opportunity to fill that seat for four years. Right. We were going to. I thought we were going to incorporate that into the general election. The very next general election would yep. be within at least two years at the longest. That way, like Heather said, whether they were um, appointed in in the first half of their term, there would be an election within two years, or in the second half. We may not be 
able to entirely solve this problem of the, of the um, imbalance in the council seats. But we can improve on it I right. think, through this process. Well, just even this upcoming election, yeah, there's going to be four council seats open or plus five. Plus a mayor. Right. It's a mayor, right. Yeah, so five. Four. Five seats. It's four council seats in the mayor. Right. So it's just so one of those, I mean, it happens, but. And we have ways of fixing that so that we go, we, we resolve that imbalance so it doesn't keep getting worse. And so we'll have to continue to do that. So, so is that language reflected in this? I mean, I'm looking and. I thought it said in the proposed change huh? part. Um, Right. The very last sentence, right? The vacant seat shall be open for election to fill the remainder of the term at the next November Memorial election. Action. So if they did end what? up in their first half or second half, it wouldn't matter. Right. Do you agree with that, Heather? Well, so what the last sentence that Andrea is referring to, I actually think should have been removed. I think it should have been removed. Because that's oh. the if council fails meeting. to fill the seat. Mm -hmm. And so the way we had remedied that is if there was a tie in the event that we had six votes right that the mayor um, would cast the deciding tie-breaking vote got it so I think the last sentence actually needs to be removed because there's no way that, that you wouldn't fill a vacancy either council is going to have a majority vote or in the event of a tie the mayor would cast the tie-breaking vote and that's how we were forcing the council's hand to get the seat filled correct versus uh, the conclave idea of you guys stay here until you figure it out right yeah. right. Right. right right that option that was my first option but everybody bring a cot and <laughs> Which most Thanks, most Heather. boards are ran that way, right? <laughs> most boards are ran where the chair sometimes will be the yeah. deciding vote, right? right. There'll be an right. even number. That's how most. Yeah. And and what we we were concerned <laughs> about in the charter provision that currently exists is that there was a period of time for the council to fill the vacancy, and if not, then the council had to call an election, a special election. Within that was one of the biggest concerns about this, right, is we were right. trying to save that $25,000. Right. $25,000, and um, it's pretty unworkable as it's, as it's stated right now because right. it has to be within 120 days of the, of the beginning of the vacancy for the election to be held. And nowadays, it, under the current election requirements of, uh, of the state of Colorado, an election process is at least four months long because of Mail. all the requirements to notify overseas uh, military folks and everything else. So, sure. um, so, so it's it's almost unworkable. But our feeling was that, that uh, as a committee, that that special election we'd like to at all, if we can, without you know removing an important step that that's, uh, belongs to the voters, really force the, the city council to make that make that appointment um, based on the criteria that the council chooses. So uh, what, what we've done is we've got, and, and we will eliminate that last sentence because, because that was part of our discussion at the last meeting that we didn't want to have the potential of a of an election to, to do that. We wanted the council to resolve the problem themselves. Right. So And we still need the language that fixes the, the term that that person fills. If it's in the first half of the vacancy, it goes to the general election. If it's in the last half, it goes to the, because it still doesn't fix the, what term does the vacant, when someone creates a vacancy, it doesn't say what term yeah. the person serves. So that still doesn't have that language in there. Okay. And if that's, um, yeah, I think I think the committee was uh, was pretty unanimous on that issue that we we didn't feel like we could appoint someone for a full yeah, let's say almost a th almost four year four, four year term like without it yeah, shouldn't be more than two years before that that person has a vote of the people right okay doesn't the last sentence allude to that though that's what no, I thought too but it. That's the vacancy. If you okay. fill the vacancy, which the whole point is to, you know, I think when Peter and I came into the discussion, there may have been the option okay. that the seat would remain open until the next election, sure. which we were like, that potentially could be for a very long time sure. where you're missing a council member. So it should read like the appointed seat shall be open for election to fill. I mean, something like that, right? Because that's essentially, that would solve the appointed seat. Peter's talking to is if, if someone resigns or quits or vacates within the first two years, <laughs> right? It goes to that general election that splits that term. Yep. For the remainder of that person's term, if it's at the end of the term, then it goes to the, the entire term. Right. So that way you get voted in as a council member 
for that second term. And you're appointed for less than two years. Exactly. And then, yeah. And yeah. it also fixes the rhythm, too, because it's impossible to get out of rhythm because the right. vacancy is always based on who the vacant person is. Right. But the vacant person's seat may be if it's off. three and a half years out. No. no. So if it's in the first right, half, first you're, half. Gonna, you're gonna go to that election in the middle to serve the next two the net, the remainder of that term. But if it's in the second half, it'll go to the regular election it would have anyways. Yeah, right. you, just make, you just fill the remainder. So one year or two or a partial term, the other one year. Clear as mud. Yeah. Love well, it. That's what I was just gonna say. <laughs> so but the, how does that solve having four council seats up? It, it doesn't fully solve doesn't it. Okay. fully. Okay. Doesn't fully yep. solve that. Yep. We looked at a lot of options to try to fix right. that. Yeah. And we can't we can't have an election on an odd year, right. because that would be the, one of the easiest ways to fix it. But right, our general municipal election is is on odd year. Or I mean, on an even year. I apologize. Right. Every you. two right. years, though. Right. But that would be the cost of an election. Yeah. Right. 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 Or you, you like just let them feel. I understand you're 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 feeling like you're not letting the voters vote, but uh, you just let them fill that term, and then you never have your never off rhythm. <laughs> and if they go and put in an appointment. They get to fill that term. Well, that's where we were until our last meeting of the of the Charter Review Committee, and uh, certainly open for discussion by the City Council whether whether you want that. There was a um, concern. I think there were concerns expressed yeah. about about filling a seat for potentially three and a half years. Over the years, um, I don't know that we've well. We, we did have one instance where a council member was elected, saw the composition of the, the new city council, and resigned immediately. <laughs> so um, was reelected, and so that uh, that turned into a um, you know that turned into a four-year term. It would have under this new scenario, but but in that case, you just use the next most vote getter, correct? Yeah, a lot of the times that's how the council elected. handled that. Yeah. Okay. I think so. So that makes it easier. Uh, my point is that. If you do that, you're never going to be off. Two, it, everybody has the right to put in their application if they want to be on that seat, right, to fulfill that seat. Sure. Um, I guess I just don't see where – I'd I rather do that and someone, somebody gets upset that says, oh, they get to serve for three years and we didn't get a vote on them, compared to having five new council members on a, on, on a, on a deal – open and a mayor new mayor five new council members and two people that have been on there for two years going we're going to do a budget process and we're going to do all these things man i I've we got it well because for example the reason <laughs> so like mine you're too yeah, busy like you're, you're, you're a great example yeah. of this you'd mine's a perfect example of how the rhythm gets off because yep um mckinsey was until 2023 mine will be 2021 so the charter doesn't say whether my 2021 election is to fill the remainder of McKinsey's term or is it to go into a new term as a council person. Traditionally, we do it as a new councilman. That means 2025, my seat's up, which throws that rhythm off. The way we were just talking, mine would go the when if I ran in 2021, it would be to go to 2023 and then be up with these guys, and that would put the rhythm back up. Does that make sense? No, I agree. Right, but, but right you would now, still have the five. Right now, it would just it, the rhythm's still off. But our charter doesn't say that you have to run in 2021. Right. Yes, I do have to run in 2021, as, as the charter says right now. I got you. Yeah. So that's why it sends it off. But it doesn't say when I'm elected or whoever's I misread that. Then. It doesn't say what term that person goes to. It goes for a four-year term, which makes it to 2025, which that's where you get your volume. That's why it's back. off. Yeah. So if, if it was a partial term, if you just serve from 2021 to 2023, a two-year term in the middle of it, then that would fix it because we would have a lot in 2021, but 2023 we'd be back into a a steady term. Right, but it still doesn't change the fact that we could get five more council members yeah. in one election. Right, but if we if we did elect you for the whole remainder of the term, then it would that would fix that. Because what happens is the two-year term in the mayor splits it to where the next time you're not off. Right. So the and the way we've had to fix it in the past is that we've said, okay, we have we have we're off kilter here. So this next election, we're going to have four council seats that are open. Three of those will be for four-year terms, and one will be for a two-year term. And we, we designate that at the beginning of the election so the, the, everyone has notice of it, and um, someone ends up with a two-year term based on the, the fourth 
But if we would have number of votes, if we would vote for the whole term, like if we would have voted him all the way until the end of McKinsey's spot, then we wouldn't be having five new seats. It would only be, it'd be three plus the mayor. Yeah, it'd still be four, but yeah, yeah. versus three and then two women. But that happens all the time. Anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I was just thinking when Gene Billadu no. resigned. Right. Um, Kent Nielsen. Kent Nielsen took it, and the next election, that's when we did the four and the two. Uh, Correct. Yep. Ken served quite a few, uh, quite a long time because Gene had. And then he was appointed as the interim mayor. And right. That changed his term, of course. Right. Yeah. He was no longer a city council member, but okay. yeah. So open for open for discussion, but that's where we are right now. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's that issue. I think that covers. The high points, really, in terms of, of that issue, it's kind of multi, multiple issues within the same within the same um, charter provision. So let's go on to the next one, if that's okay with you. And um, <clears throat> this is departments created and abolished. So uh, this has come come out of, of course, um, discussions and things that we've been through recently as as the city looked at at uh, possibly changing departments within the city of Craig, eliminating a department or reducing, you know, a department, adding, adding a department potentially. And so what, we've, uh, what we have come up with as a committee and would like to recommend is that um, before, as it currently stands right now actually, the, um, the city council has all all uh, right and power and authority to be able to add departments or to abolish departments. And um, really it's stated as departments created in the charter right now and we're changing it to departments created or abolished or recommending that. And basically that no department of the city shall be created or abolished except by an amendment to the charter and that all departments that currently exist shall remain unless abolished by future actions action of the registered electors in an election. So it's, um, that's, that's uh, what this issue addresses. Um, there are pros and cons, and we've tried to list some pros and cons in our issue statement um, in terms of flexibility of, cons of, of this particular, going forward with this particular issue would be, there would be a loss of flexibility in terms of management of the, of the city and um, that, but uh, it, it basically states a strong feeling that um, the, city, the city government should, uh, big, big picture issues, really big picture issues should be taken to a vote of the people. And that's what's behind this particular provision or this particular recommendation, so. In the discussion behind that, from what I remember, um, Vicky was very adamant that it, she doesn't feel like a council. If I'm, if I say this incorrectly, please, please correct me. Should have the right to just say, okay, we're done with the police department. Okay, we're done with Parks and Rec. I, I think everybody in the room agreed. The concern on Randy brought up was he didn't want a council's hands to be tied in a very poor economic time, and and so just. Just to say it, it, the way that a council, if this is passed, which I'm a supporter of, the way that a council handles that is through funding or defunding, if you will, right? I mean, I, most responsible councils, in my opinion, are not going to sit up here and say, okay, we're done with Parks and Rec, we're done with the police. We're just not going to do that. <clears throat> but there could be a point in time in the future, economically speaking, that you say, okay, we've had to reduce the force or so on and so forth. So if I'm saying that correctly, it, it still gives council the ability to economically be, you know, fiscally responsible about running the city, but at the same time doesn't give them so much authority that they can say, we're done with that without going to the voters. Right. Well, and this, so, this did just happen in Minneapolis with the George Floyd, yeah. where the city council decided to defund the police and come up with their own, their own thing. So I, I go back and forth on this one. I, I get both sides of it. But it's, uh, did, you're right. Right. And that's, and that's the other thing about this, right, is that... So, right. so, so this is a paper change then, because council controls the purse strings, will mm -hmm. continue to control the purse sure. strings. Yep. So we could have a police department, or I, I, this is all aimed at the police department, so let's put the gorilla on the table. <laughs> all right. Um, from that standpoint, 
uh, just on past experience, but I'm going to throw out another couple of examples. So you, you, you keep a police department, make uh, whoever, Trevor, you're now police chief and you have $10 a budget. You met, you met the purpose of the charter, you contracted the services out, what, whatever. I, I think one point we all can agree on, councils, this council, next council, and the next council are going to have some very, very unpopular, hard decisions to make. Okay? Advocating this responsibility, in my judgment, we're doing a disservice to the community because, you know, that's our job. That's why we were voted in by the citizens. The citizens picked every one of us up here. We didn't pick ourselves. They advocated that responsibility to us. So let me throw out a couple of examples here. Let's just say we talked about trash tonight, right? Trash service. So that solid waste department. So when we have to make some tough budget decisions down the road and the city has an opportunity to cut costs in the solid waste department and there's a contractor or an, an, a private company wants to come in and buy our assets, provide solid waste service, okay? We can't do that unless we go to the vote of the people. If I was a businessman trying to make that deal work, well, how soon's your next election? That's two years away. My offer is not going to stay out there for two years, number one. Number two, let's just say build a pool is uh, successful in forming their district. I'm not going to say they're, they're going to do that or not, but let's just say they are successful. They form a district. Would it make sense for the city, the county, and the rec district all to have their own separate parks and rec department? Okay, or we have to go through a two-year process and an election, okay, to educate the voters, why not would it be more efficient for parks to, to the recreation district have all the parks, all the rec parks and recreation? So okay? this you know, I, I wish I could say right now every voter puts the time and effort in there that probably Vicki does to know, to know the issues. But emotions come into play. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility fiscally to this community to make the best decisions moving forward. And there's going to be some tough decisions. Okay? Can I also tell you guys? Uh, <laughs> <Why not? laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, not all of the citizens voted for you and Andrea and Jared. But the majority did. Yeah, well, enough to get us elected, yeah. Right, enough to get you elected. So, because we have a good council now, it doesn't mean that we will going forward. Huh. Right? It doesn't mean well, that we have a good one going forward, a responsible one going forward. So, no, you can't just decide to, uh, you can cut the funding on the police department or the, the trash department, but you can't mm -hmm. just get rid of them. You people up there can't just say, oh no, they're done and we're getting rid of this department. That you have to take to the, vo to the voters. But and that's why it was worded this way. The, other, the two issues I have with this that come with this is the museum and the police, right? I don't like what's happening in Minneapolis where the city council is just abolishing the police department. But I also, if we would have not been able to create and had to wait for two years, we wouldn't have the museum right now. The museum would have went away. Create a department. You slid him in under something else. But he's a department now. He's on his own, right? He's his own department. You didn't actually create a new department for the city called the museum department, is my point. So, so just, just to clarify this, before, before, because I'm curious myself, Heather, I guess I'm going to look to you. Um, did we create a department by adding a museum, or? So that was pre -month. I understand. <laughs> I, I, if, if Sherman wants to answer, I'm fine. I, I just am looking for legal advice here because it's a valid question. And then my other question would be if, if we did not, if, if we could have done that regardless, which it seems how you feel we could have done. I'm not sure. I agree, kind of. I'm not sure. If that's the case, then... Moving forward to Chris's point, if we get a rec district and we decide that we're going to combine efforts and not have a 
city-funded parks and rec department, is there a way to still potentially put, without abolishing the department, to just put that those efforts into that rec district? I mean, because, right, it would go either way from what you're saying, but I guess I'm looking for a legal opinion. Something big like that, I don't think. But I think a museum is just as big. Not arguing, but I, I just I don't like the loopholes either. Like so, right. so the people say, okay, you can't take away the police department. We say, okay, then it's, the police department is just Jerry. Got we contract it all out. Year, that's right. that's a hundred percent within our power, and the and the people. What did the people win? To a degree, council votes on pretty big. I mean, we just voted on a million dollars worth of bills this month. I mean, we take big ticket actions all the time. That's what we're to do. And the, your recourse for it is, is also recall. If you don't like what we do, you can recall and put someone else in here. Um, that, that's really the voters. The voters always have the right to go, you're done, we're going to kick you out of there, we're going to put somebody else in your, your shoes. I, I, so I, what if we get six people up there that are you can recall them. and we're going to recall well, six people you can. and then we've got just There's people. no one person going to go rogue up here. I don't, the council. I don't mean to say, you know? Vicki, what, what I'm going to oh. say, that what that's this that's does, that's does that's is that's it doesn't that's fix that's the problems you address because as long as council holds the purse, we can do whatever we want with the money. So that means I can fund it for $5, or I could put $5 million over there as a, as a vote up here. And if seven people agree with me, or the majority of the people vote on it, then that's what happens. What this does do is it ties your hands if a mandate comes down. Like if, if, if tomorrow Colorado says you have to have a public health department, we have to set up that department because of statute, and we're required to or mandated to do it. This wouldn't allow us to do such a thing like that. And like to Chris's point, if something else comes up that's more economic efficient, we couldn't abolish or, or merge those together without people voting on that. And in the end, all it is, it's a waste of resource time to, to go through and say, okay, well, this now has to go to a November election where we got to pay to put it on the ballot to do something we have to do. Does that kind of make sense? Like we're mandated to do it, but we have to actually have to do it. You do when you vote for us. That's exactly what you, you vote us for to do. <laughs> I mean, it, this has been in the charter forever, though. I, I have to agree. I mean, this, is, this has been, it's, it's currently our power, and it has been the power of previous city councils. Yeah. You know, so it has existed there. We've even been able to abolish. Yeah, we have. No, it has been. The, that currently. Has been. Yeah. It's, and it's that's been, been in the charter. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is. Yep. And, and I think it creates probably more conflict between the city council and the community um, because I get what you're saying. You don't want the seven people to have this kind of power, but I agree with Ryan. Your power is in the vote. Um, and so this, I don't know how to say it. I mean, it's late and I'll just say it. This is kind of, this is kind of feel good language for the community, but it creates a lot of problems because well, it's a shell because they control the finances, and so they can they have the put whatever word on on it that you want. If you pull the funding, you abolish that. That's what we did. Right. It, it's right. title only. That's, right. that's all it is. Yeah, because I, I like I said, I don't like what's going on in, in Minneapolis right now. Right. Uh, there's a lot of people that are going to be unprotected, and it's it's tragic. But mm -hmm. but at the same time, I, I don't know how you get around that. Right. Because because I. I don't want the police department to just be Jerry, but we absolutely could if the people said we want to keep it. We just make it Jerry and contract it all out. It is one of the downsides of representative government versus direct democracy. It's terrible. It's one of those things that's always been there. Yeah. It's, it's hard to... Well, we're not only talking police here. I know that was on the table. We're talking all the other departments. Right. And I think it kind of you came know? up in the... Con I'm sorry, Chris. It came up in the context of department, like adding a department such as... Well, exactly. What happens down the road? We want government to, to grow... <laughs> well, we what happens government? is we need to add an <laughs> economic development department down the road. Them, Peter goes and goes, I've had it. I can't do it all by myself anymore. Well, let, let yeah. Sherman <laughs> Sleet answer my question. <laughs> oh, did you ask a question? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. About the museum. Is About the museum. Oh. Is it a department or not? Yeah, and I think, I think I it was... I we were even starting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, believe it, I believe that it's budgetarily it, it has its own budget. Department section at, like a department does. So if we and were... Is a is a department head in terms of the organizational structure of the city. So we didn't maybe use those exact words as we were going through the process of passing our 
uh, our ordinance to accept it, but um, we control his budget, though. Right. You control. And I know budget. that I know that that was supposed to be a 50-50 deal with the county, right? We were supposed to both contribute 150,000. Then we decided last minute, let's just take it over the museum. Right. Um, but that wasn't. That's not always going to be the deal next time. Right. Right. That we go in 50-50, and when uh, when something like that, you know, that situation occurs, we would have to go two years, and they wouldn't have had the right reserves to to make it. Right. And I, it may be there. Council members are only elected every two years at a general election, but the city can propose questions at each November election. Each November election, you can, you can send issues to the voters that are not required to be at the general election. So I don't think it's necessarily a two-year leap every time someone we want to make it, take a question to the voters. So, so that being said about the museum, had have th had this been passed already in, in the current form that we're trying to looking at changing it to, would we have been able to take on the museum without going to vote? I don't think so. Well, I, it kind of goes to the loophole. Right. Too, so there is a loophole. I mean, that's what I'm asking. It could be put under, you know, Parks and Rec. If this, <laughs> yeah. if this I mean, we <laughs> could have. It could be put if under, you merge it into a different administration. Sure. Like so this really, back to your point, and, and I don't mean any offense by this, but this really is lip service. It, in my opinion. A feel-good kind of thing. Like, oh, we don't have this power, but in really? all honesty, whoever's sitting up here does. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I'm going back to when uh, we wanted to create a new economic development department and pay somebody $92,000 or whatever it was to What I will say to that is I was, uh, I mean, was, that was quite a while before I was elected, but um, I was at that meeting, and there was people filled. They were out, out there, all of them opposed, here telling that council at the time not to create a new department in government. You know, so. Uh, that, exactly, right? I mean, that's your point. So, Same thing if, if we something that wave pool, yeah. be filled that important or that egregious comes up, hopefully people come in, right? I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was, I was there with you on this. But the more that we talk about it, and who knows, right? This council, obviously, I think listens very well. Councils in the past have, have not. It, I, I think it, I was with you on this. But the more we talk about this, I have concerns, I think, like looking down the road. Um, I mean, the museum, for instance, that if, if everybody would have been against that, you two were for it. Save it somehow. If everybody was against it, and all this council had to do was go, okay, well, he's part of Parks and Recs now. <laughs> we didn't create anything. We just, <laughs> we just allocated some funds over here. To me, that's that's shadier, right? I, I mean, that, that feels more like a slimy politician <laughs> to where we're just upfront about it now and saying, you know, this is what we feel like. We're hearing from our citizens, so let's make it happen. When, when the discussion came up about the police department, people came in and said, this should not happen. Absolutely. We stopped that as a council, right? We stopped. So I... You're right. You're absolutely right about that. But changing this makes it worse, in my opinion, the more that we look at this. And as Ryan said, and, and I think Heather said, you, the citizens, have the right to say, okay, they've made some poor choices. It's time for those people to not sit up there. And, and that's when you go into a recall petition. The truth is elections have consequences. And the more informed the record is, the, the better the council will be. And, and that's, I wish we could do that to everybody, is make sure everybody knows the issues that are before the city. But a lot of that is on part of being a community member is informing yourself on what's going on in your community. So, um, yeah, there could you could get a horrible group up here, but still... Um, this doesn't fix that because this still allows them to control the purse. It almost actually allows them to be more horrible. <laughs> it actually allows them to be more, um, just actually worse. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the because then it's that oh, wink, yeah. wink, you know, oh, yeah, we won't do that. Because they got to find loopholes. And then loopholes. <laughs> well, whoever controls the money controls yeah. it. So since the council would always control the funding. Bottom line. Right. 
Should we go on? Should we go on? Go on. <laughs> this is turning into a this is turning into a charter review meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this conversation sounds familiar. We're going to get dinner. <laughs> that's why we that's why we do this. I think the next one's pervy. Too. The next two actually yeah, hopefully are related. Next two are related. Uh, issue 3 and issue 4 have to do with residency <laughs> uh, requirements. And issue 3 involves the city manager position. And the issue has come up whether or not a residency requirement for the city manager is um, is necessary, and whether or not we may um, have candidates in the future for city council who uh, we good candidates that we may not um, be able to close the deal on because of because of that residency requirement. We don't have residency requirements for any of our empl other employees. Um, we have a fairly high percentage, well, we have a percentage of employees, I don't know what that exact number is, who live outside of the city of Craig, and we deal with those issues related to response time concerning their jobs and that kind of thing uh, through our, our management of the city. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, there have been arguments in the past that a uh, city manager, you know, needs to be one of us. <laughs> And uh, and that's you know that's a good that's a good argument I, and I think uh, it's it's not always the case that someone that lives just outside of city limits is not one of us. No, that makes them one of them. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm kidding. I, I just I I've been laughing about that since I saw it. It's actually kind of ridiculous that statement. I think one of us. Well, we, and we may have uh, we may have someone, for example, that you know has a couple of prized horses or something like that that they couldn't keep within the city of Craig, or wanted their children to participate in 4-H activities, that kind of thing. So, um, anyway, those are those are some of the things that we've discussed and balanced in, in making this recommendation. So, the rec recommendation is that the city manager would be a resident of the city of Craig or within Moffat County, but not more than 10 miles. Um, outside of city limits. A new city manager would meet that requirement within six months of beginning their employment. And um, basically that, um, and that's, you know, that's a line that can be discussed and, and addressed, but when it comes to, for example, emergency management, you know, if we, if we were in a, a situation where there was, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, Y two K. We all thought we all thought the roof was going to fall in on you know January first at, at midnight, and the city manager and the the team needed to be right here and ready to to deal with everything. And of course, not, fortunately, nothing happened of significance. But we were we were ready. The manager would have just been right. sitting here regardless, right? Right. And and now we live in a world of you know cell phones and and video conferencing technology. And technology has changed those issues to to a great extent. So, yep. right. Um, and uh, the city manager could certainly bunker at home as well as as. Uh, but that's uh, that's where we are on that issue. So um, certainly, I think you're going to get you're going to get some. Um, public response to an, an issue like this. So I think that's important to listen to the public response. My sense, my sense is that it's a changing, we have in, to some extent a changing de demographic in Craig and that that affects this issue. So. My only suggestion on this one is that it probably should read um, within six months of the beginning of his or her employment. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Um, Potentially. Yeah. Um, there. Absolutely. There? Sure, we go that route. No. There. <laughs> Not intentional. No. That opens we it up to those. Doing that. That His opens it up to those unidentifiables. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> we could go the other direction, just build him quarters here. We could. <laughs> just get more production out of you. <laughs> it's come up a few times, and uh, I'll have to be perfectly frank with you. When Dan Wilson looked at this, <clears throat> he felt like. Uh, the city manager should have to live within city limits. Now, I th as an advocate for city managers, I would I would like to see a provision like this that gives somebody the latitude to have a, a farm animal or something like that should they want to come here. And you might have a candidate in the future here that uh, you really want here that requires that, that sort of thing, and you might want to provide that amenity. Sure. So Back to our other conversation about the county taps, too. If we had a housing development to go in, somewhere like Shadow Run, or Shadow Mountain, I mean, then, I mean, in that area, 
they wouldn't be qualifying. Right. Exactly. Right. So hopefully after this next November, Peter can build out there. Sure. This it's is going to work out. Market to bring people yeah. to our area is the outdoors. Yep. Yeah. Like okay, I've got to live within these five square miles. You can live in this apartment complex. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This block next to this guy. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Reasonable. All right. It's me, and I shoot off fireworks every night. <laughs> those, are, those are the stipulations. Actually, so, no. There is an ordinance for that. <laughs> We're to build housing. All right. And then the, the fourth issue is that um, the judge and the, and the city attorney, we wanted to address those issues um, and remove or recommend that a judge wouldn't necessarily have to be a resident of uh, Moffat County and just a licensed attorney within the state of Colorado. And also, um, let's see, municipal uh, city attorney uh, would not necessarily have to be a resident of the city or the county. And of course, we've addressed, we've addressed some of those issues recently as the city's looked at um, hiring for those positions. And um, there's sometimes a very limited pool of candidates. You want to have a good, a good candidate. and and, and it's something that now a lot of times firms that aren't residents of the city um, will sometimes do on, con on a contract basis for communities of certain sizes, um, if they're, particularly if there aren't good candidates and you don't want to create a full-time position, that kind of thing. So, so you've addressed those, those issues recently or you've seen those issues on your, on your, um, in your packet. And, so uh, those are the recommendations of the of the of the board of the group. I'm against this one, 100. Um, percent I, I think that if we hire a firm from outside of Moffat County, uh, they need to put an office here and they need to invest into our community. Um, our lawyer. I don't care if they live in the county because I feel like city, county, they're all together. I, I don't. Moffat County is Craig, Colorado. I don't. I don't see there's a huge difference there, but. To give them the license, I, we don't want, well, maybe I, I shouldn't say we, I don't want the Route County mentality in Moffat County. That's why I don't live in Route County. I live in Moffat County. To have them, and I understand we can still hire them. I sure. get it. We still have the choice to hire, or the council does. But I, I, don't, I'm, I don't like the idea of giving them the opportunity. Um, now, I would say if there could be a revision in here that says, if you're a firm from out of out of Moffat County, you have six months to put a for an office here, staffed, and and invest into our community. Don't just take our money and leave and uh, and invest into Glenwood or into. Um, I think that's why we we went with you know Heather is that she's invested in our community. I mean, and I think we always have people here now. You know that are good people that are invested here. So. I'm 100% against this one. So, and I wasn't on the committee. I didn't hear all your guys' arguments. So, but from the outside looking in, I'm I'm 100% against this. Yeah, one. no, there's something to that sense of community that we're trying to build and build stronger in this community too. And being the outsider, you, you never build that. You never get it. Issues, you know. Yeah, yeah, and you may get a lot of uh, public input on this one as well. So, um, okay. Well, those are those are the issues. <clears throat> unless uh, unless we get some direction immediately, we'll pre we'll present those, I guess, in ordinance form for your consideration, and uh, the city attorney will will prepare those and we'll go from there. Okay. When does this have to be done by? End of August. End of August. Our yeah. second meeting in August. So, right. You could call a special meeting in August, probably, if you had to, but. So we, we can should, still do it within the time frame that you have. We should see an introduction at our next meeting. Right. Okay. 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 Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Chairman. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay. Up next is n item 9G, and that is discussion and action to approve a change order to SGM for completion of Phase 1 and Phase 2 sludge line design in the amount of $137,015. Peter? I think, uh, Trevor, are you going to address that or you want yeah. Okay. So we have a 
a grant for the sludge line project and there's funding remaining you know as you guys all know we awarded the phase one construction last meeting um, with that it came in under our remaining budget and the intent here is to finish the design of the rest of the project from phase one all the way to the sludge ponds as well as SGM did not have funding um, allocated for uh, phase one um, engineering services and surveying so that's what this request is is for to make sure we can utilize the grant funding that we have uh, currently been awarded um, before it is we don't want to give it back in a nut basically so but so it would only be money for engineering no engineering construction for this correct and not for not for additional construction work it's for As engineering construction services and design for phase finish of phase one and complete of phase two which would be the remainder of the design of the sludge line and then there will still be remaining funding around a couple hundred thousand dollars um, depending on how fast we can get this design completed this year we'd be able to potentially create a change order for the contractor and continue as far as we can with the remainder grant money that we have to make sure we utilize it and not give it back so that would be that would be contingent upon weather construction schedule potentially more additional construction yeah for, first part get phase one completed engineering staking so forth um, a couple extra little things that we have to do get the design complete for the remainder of the sludge line see what the difference is remaining in our budget that could be allocated for a change order to the contractor and we could spin that to you know maybe we can do another 2,000 feet um, whether it be this year pending weather or next spring once that money is spent um, we would have to hopefully get another grant in the future and then put back out to bid the remainder of the construction the design should be done at that point so if further construction is feasible uh, this additional 2,000 feet which I'm assuming is beyond phase one plus addendum a and addendum B right, right? in addition to that this would be addendum C if you will yep. would that portion be um, rebid or just automatically yep. handed to the existing contractor that would be handed to the existing contractor for the remainder of the current budget that we have and okay. grant okay. and then beyond that we had to put it back out to bid the whole goal is to make sure we utilize the current funding and grant that we've been allocated does that follow our bid process for yeah, we've uh, you guys have authorized the full amount. Okay. Uh, at, okay. At least from the budget standpoint, we'd come back to you though with a uh, with a change order. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And basically, talking to the contract, just trying to prepare for the, for discussion in the future. Uh, looking at items A and B is approximately what the linear footage price would be based off of the awarded contracts uh, price. So for a change order this is not any new money this is just yeah this is just the exactly okay yeah. just potentially able to use the rest of it and get more done absolutely yep okay yeah, we're, we're under budget and we want to make sure cool. we utilize the grant sure absolutely yeah the other thing is uh, to de-obligate that funding based on what's coming next year we've already been informed that uh, dola is going to eliminate one or two grant cycles next year if not if not the entire year and so we won't be seeing any grant funding for some time sure. after we still have grant funding in uh, the august cycle and the december cycle this year and that's limited so thank you covid yes exactly <laughs> got it okay um council any further questions for Peter or Trevor? No. Nope. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. Um. <laughs> 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 
So this is for phase two? Yeah, phase one. Are we allowed to make dollies? No, this I don't know how the word the most. To completion well, of phase one. So. Engineering. Yeah, design. For, for construction management of phase one and for the construction design, engineering and design for phase two to complete that design all the way out to the sludge ponds. So moved. Yeah, that's what I was getting. So moved. <laughs> well spoken, Peter. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm serious. Okay. <laughs> Great. Second. Second? Okay. So do I put Peter Brixius down on this? I don't do this. <laughs> Matter if it is. Because I was looking at it, and I'm not sure exactly yeah, I'm like, what, what's the what the wording was going to be. Okay, so the motion was made by Councilman Nichols, seconded by Councilman Boyer, um, to approve the change order to SGM for the completion of Phase 1 and Phase 2 sludge line design in the amount of $137,015. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Liz, would you pull the council, please? Councilman Nichols? Aye. Councilman Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, Council. And Peter. <laughs> Up next is uh, item 9H action to approve a letter of support for the Regional Net Metering Partnership DOLA grant submittal submission made by Steamboat Springs, Colorado, in time for the August grant cycle. Peter. Okay. So, um, this is the uh, location-specific net metering project for the wastewater treatment and the water treatment plant. And um, if you look at this table on the cover sheet of this letter, it shows that those two project costs amount to about $960,000 for both sites. This letter, uh, if you would authorize the mayor to sign this letter, that would show our support for the grant that's going to be submitted uh, by Steamboat Springs, who will continue to be the fiscal agent for that grant. Although we will continue to have individual negotiating authority for each of these sites. So uh, regionally, we would support the grant, which uh, we're looking at uh, roughly 1.9 million is what's going to be requested from DOLA at the next grant cycle. And this is not from funding that's set aside for anything but solar. So we are an energy impacted site with our coal and oil and gas. And this funding is being set aside from energy impact, Im, impact funds. So we might as well pursue it. Uh, the the uh, net metering project, uh, if you look at this table, would uh, offset $41,885 a year for wastewater treatment and $31,799 for water treatment each year. Um, and so during the first 10 years, plus the DOLA grant funding, it would pay for the, uh, the $960,000 investment that goes into it would cover our match uh, for the investment that goes into the construction of these two sites. So we would have not, we would not have any out-of-pocket dollars that go into this project, but for the first 10 years, the solar savings would go towards paying off the solar field at each of these locations. That would leave about 20 years of operation uh, with these uh, approximated annual savings at each of the sites. So after in the 11th year is when the plant would really start to experience an offset in their utility billing. Uh, so for the next uh, 11 through 30 is about uh, the period of time when you would see that offset. So Peter, is this kind of like performance contract? This is a performance contract through the Colorado Energy Office. So they would manage the contract, McKinstry, would actually be a assigned partner on this project, and they would have the uh, obligation to fulfill the contract and guarantee the contract. These are guaranteed energy savings over the life of the contract. Guarantee. Okay. So they build it at no cost to the city. That's right. And then for the next 10 years, they get paid back those amounts. After they're paid back, 
It's money in our pocket. And we're not committing to any match because... We're not committing to any out-of-pocket match. Okay. The match is to be paid for by the solar savings. And if there's a um, fire that comes through this <laughs> 640 <clears throat> acres or whatever we're looking at and burns these things, um, they replace them and we're back on because we're guaranteed the money. I've never had that question, Tony. Well, I didn't think I about would, it until you go to Call a While right now right? and you see that they had these big um, transformers right. there that um, they're working on every single day now. So uh, I'm just curious. I would assume that this is, would be an insured asset of the city. Of the city. Under under uh, our CERSA policy. Okay. Okay. And they have maintenance. The, the O&M costs would be covered in the contract. <laughs> kind of a no-brainer, it feels like. And uh, Dola has pretty much indicated that uh, the grant funding would be allocated once once it was presented for this project. Is that is that grant funding allocated to all the stakeholders? Yeah, if you look at the next sheet, the uh, table, that grant funding would cover the allocation necessary for these 14 locations that are listed here. Wow. And what each, uh, which, what each party at this point needs to provide is a letter of support for the grant outlining what your project looks like. And so I know, Jared, you represent the school district. Uh, a similar letter would have to sure. be generated. So none of these sites have to have any money up front? That's right. God dang. Well, it's too bad they're not building coal power plants, but right. well, I guess we'll take solar panels. <laughs> but at least cuts operating costs yeah, exactly. down the road. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. There is an interest rate that's built into this uh, amortization over 10 years. It kind of comes out in this net present value, which kind of – the net present value is uh, kind of a cash flow generation calculation that I um, – would not be able to explain to you necessarily, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so it's not fuzzy math to make it work. Okay. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, Mayor, I will move that we approve support for the letter um, on behalf of the Net Metering Regional Solar Partnership. Is that sufficient? Second. Second. Okay. Motion was made by Councilwoman Camp, seconded by Councilman Nichols to approve the letter of support for the Regional Net Metering Partnership uh, DOLA grant submittal submission. Liz, we're going to talk about the wording on this, okay? I know you did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, any further discussion? Hearing none, Liz, would you please poll the council? Councilman Nichols? Aye. Councilman Camp? Aye. Councilman Boyer? Aye. Councilman Camp? Aye. Councilman James? Aye. Councilman Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, up next, staff reports. Uh, Chief, you're up first. They can't hear me anyways. Uh, you have my month in report, but at the last meeting, there are some questions that came up on Senate Bill 217 that has a direct reflect on the police department. Uh, as if you've read it, anything with any money ties, they extended it out to 2023. The body cameras, the release of data that we're collecting now. Uh, one thing I just want to mention on the body cams, we're set on body cams. All of our officers have body cams, but there's a provision in the Senate Bill 217 that it's presumptive that if an officer's body cam is not working, that that officer did something wrong. Misconduct. So what I'm looking at doing is buying some spare body cams. Sure. I mean, because we have officers coming to work or officers going home, we get a call, and they've got to have the body cam. So we're looking at that, uh, purchasing probably six to eight uh, body cams. We've got a body cam. The investigators, when they go out, the administrators are exempt from it, but the investigators aren't exempt for it unless they're working undercover. So... That's what we have to worry about. And with the added body cams, we're looking at the cost of unlimited storage in uh, the cloud. 
uh, I talked to the chief in Hayden and the chief in Steamboat. Both of them went to Unlimited, and I asked the question, well, how much did it cost? And both of them said, I had somebody else do it, but we've got to have it. So right now, I think it is $1,500 a year that we're paying for terabytes, and we either have uh, it's four terabytes that we currently are using. The law requires that we go with the state retention on this. Well, the kicker to this is within two years after an incident, somebody has the ability to file a lawsuit against us. So the retention record, in my opinion, is out for the protection of the officers and the city. Anything that we do, we're keeping for two years because the possibility is there that we could get sued. And I want to protect the officers and the city as best we can. So we're keeping everything for two years. And so I don't know how much space we're going to need. And that's why I'm looking at the unlimited portion of that. Oh, I left. I made myself notes. Uh, next thing is uh, profiling and release of the collected data. Uh, as of June 19th, we're collecting data. Uh, right at this point in time, they don't know the platform because the state does not have to release that data until 2023, July of 2023. So we're collecting the data, and my idea, and it didn't, I, they thought it was funny, but I think it's a great idea, is we do everything handwritten, and then when the state says we want your data, I put it in a box, all the handwritten stuff, put it in a box, cost me 30 bucks, send it to Denver and say, here's your data. But right at this point in time, they don't know how they're going to get that data from us. What I've been hearing is that our records people, people will have to enter that data. So I've got it set up uh, on a Google Doc, so it's keeping track of the stuff that's required that we have to collect. You know race, age, gender, what we stop them for, did they get a ticket, did they get arrested, all of that stuff we're collecting right now. Uh, one of the other things is the new use of force that's written into Senate Bill 217. We had training last Wednesday by Matt Carson, who is RDA, so we've got that covered. Uh, we had two officers that were not there at the training, they were on vacation, so we'll get them caught up with it. Uh, we're working with uh, Lexapol, they'll come out with a new policy, I'm thinking in probably the next couple, three months, or a couple, three weeks to address that our policy fits what the state statute is. So that's what uh, Senate Bill 217 does. And some of the other chiefs that I've talked to says they're looking for the bigger agencies, a 30 to 40 percent reduction in work from the officers, because you know, with all the added paperwork, and then you're going to find some officers that are, you know, why do I want to contact this guy with the possibility of a lawsuit? So, you know, that's in the back of the officers' minds. And so far, I got to say, we've got such a good staff that has not slowed down. You see in our month in report, we're still making contacts, we're making traffic stops, but we live in a community that support us and I think we do the right thing, so. Mm -hmm. I agree. So is there any questions on the month in? I'd like to, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask, does all that apply to the state police too or is it just the immunity that they took? Oh. With the body cam footage, all that stuff, do they have to do the same thing? Yes, except for the qualified immunity. Qualified immunity still stays with the state police. Yeah. But I think over time and we had a, a document that uh, SIRSA put out to us that, you know, this law is going to change in the next five, ten years. Something, it's going to change. It's not going to stay the same. But right at this point in time, they can't say when the changes are made, is it going to be better or is it going to be worse sure. right at this point. Was there, was there a reason that the state police don't have, a, that they, they maintain the immunity? State employees. Well, it's just yeah, weird that the state would. Sue the no, it, it, boil, it, boils down, <laughs> it boils down to money because, right. you know, if they get the way it's set up, it could cost the state of Colorado a lot of money. If they don't care about the county or the city. No. no. Cool. I got yeah. it. Okay. In DOW, so like DOW, it only applies to post-certified that are actually working. Colorado State Patrol is the 
only state law enforcement entity that the body cam applies to. So the liquor code, those types, they're, they're exempt. So like detectives and stuff that don't have to be in uniform, do they have to still have a body cam? Like CBI? CBI does not have no, to be not part of. Our investigators do. Yeah. You're, yeah, I'm talking about, I'm talking about local yeah. detectives. Crazy. Cool. Yeah, I was just going to say, 22 abandoned cars. I mean, I mean where, where are we finding these cars at? I mean, Almost, you can go around the block and find one. Yeah. Well, and only four of them or three of them got towed. Yeah. So they moved the rest of them that people did? Yeah. Or that, just, that number just seemed crazy to me. Well, it used to be when we first started doing it, I can remember Jill and Josh, they would tow 22 cars in a month. We'd have some pretty big auctions. <laughs> 74 weed complaints, huh? Wow. <laughs> and just to let you know, Chris brought up that we had a lot of weed complaints. We just started abating some of those properties in the last week, 10 days. So you'll see that we'll be sending in, or we'll be having invoices from those uh, properties getting abated. And it's the same ones every year. They're, you know. Yeah. Sorry you have to do that, but, yeah. yeah. But thank you. But yeah. there have to be consequences for mm -hmm. not following, so. Chief, can we talk about CAPS for just a minute? Sure. How, how, uh, how is that going to affect your department? I guess uh, I'm just leaving it open for you. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to have we, we'll have fewer calls for service there okay. because there's nobody there. And, you know, and the biggest thing for CAPS is, OK, they come in. Originally, when CAPS was started, it was for 14 judicial district diversion and it gave the judges an option instead of sending them to prison or just put them on probation here's a step in between okay. okay when it originally started it was for 14 judicial only but then you get companies involved and they're looking at the bottom line they have to be making money so you know it turned into more of a money making for the companies and we they're supposed to have programs, you know, and get them back into working towards getting them back into society. Well, in my opinion, this last company did not do that. I mean, they had it just for one reason and one reason only. You know, so that hurts our local people, but they still will still have a board that we vote on the local people that we can send them out of district. So like Mesa County, Garfield County, they have, so we can still give the judge that option that they can send them to uh, CAPS or Halfway House, whatever you want to call it, for those individuals. But we won't be getting people that we import in from El Paso County for whatever reason, because like if they walk away or commit another crime while they're in Craig, they're ours now. Right. Through the judicial system, we can't ship them back to or we could not ship them back to El Paso County where they'd have to face charges here and then they would be ours. Got it. So that's the, I think for the community that that's the biggest thing is that we're not importing people to sure. stay in our community. Well, it just happened rather quickly. I mean, we, yeah. we had that one meeting with everybody. I zoomed in that one. And um, then next thing I knew, <laughs> Peter's like, yeah, they closed that. I'm like, what? <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> so just was, I, 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 yeah, I guess neither here nor there, but yeah, just curious how that affected your department, obviously. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Anything else for the Chief? No. Nope. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dennison, Parks and Rec. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, anyone brief? So a couple updates. Breeze Park, making great uh, progress and try to finalize um, the renovation there. We'll have electricity run on the East Pavilion, and we'll be done there, so that's fantastic. Uh, a big one was the wave pool renovation. Mid-America uh, completed that. They did a great job. The, there was con some concerns on the sidewalls um, at the one time. The president came out of the company <coughs> and addressed them, so they were super thorough uh, with their work. And 
it turned out it turned out great. So um, now we just uh, look it into to cover that bad boy, you know, this this winter somehow. So sports, are you sports? Uh, soccer, look pretty good enrollment. That's going well. Um, so that's that's good. Um, I'm looking forward to um, the future, the fall programs there. So yeah, going going well. So potential for Doak Walker football this year? Yeah, it's we're we're hopeful. Yeah, okay. we'll see. Limit, limiting admittance to the pool. How's that working? You turning away a lot of people, or where we haven't at the beginning? You know, we had a limited capacity, and it was a few days. The res reservations worked pretty well, um, and that was hard to turn away um, some patrons, but. Overall, you know, once that variance passed, we were able to increase it, and we haven't hit capacity yet on it. So it's been it's been going well. Staff's been doing great over there. And your soccer program was that limited this year, or number of people, or limit? It was. There's a um, at the early variance. There's 25 uh, outside. Then they increased that capacity, so we're we're good there. And then we even extended the registration deadline, you know, to get as many kids as we could. So it's going well so far. Good. Okay. Yep. Swim lessons are on. Okay. Yep. Doing good. Did you want to make that correction to the flowers? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and like appreciate the compliments on the on the flowers, ladies. Steps are good. So thank you. Let's go ahead. Thank you, sir. So um, just looking at the one picture that looks like kind of a, yeah, yeah, painful landscape. It, it got another code after that, right? Yeah. Great. Yes, for sure. Good news. Oh. Okay. Just thought I'd yeah. clarify. Yeah, under that water, there it is. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, that's woo. A little rough one. <laughs> yeah, that, that looked painful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's like mentioned, you know, when we were, when I came before you counseled for, for funding for that, it just, to really seek to, to cover that and try to keep that as long as we can. Yeah. Well, you, you brought me out there once during the process, and it, it was pretty crazy there. Right where it really steps off and starts to get steep, they found that plaster like six inches yeah. thick. It was, yeah, it, it did not make the contractor's day from what I understood. They but, were out there for, for a minute, but um, the end product, they, it turned out great. So. so have you looked at numbers yet to try to cover this? I haven't. Okay. Uh, Next. Is this going to be like a stretch type tarp that pins? Similar in? probably to lap pool. I assume that's the only uh, aquatics tarps I know of. You know, but it's going to take some research, definitely on my part, to sure to see what we can do. That I'm sure it's going to be custom. Yeah. You know, but yeah, absolutely. When, when, uh, yes, go ahead. Again. You know, uh, Dave or your predecessor came to council and said we needed to start planning or budgeting. Or major reinvestment there if we're going to keep that pool active did they run into anything there on the walls especially the walls were caving in any structural issues or you know prior they did i'm not for sure when um well it was actually 10 11 years ago when they resurfaced that the last time the last contractors did a great job on the concrete work but um, the current ones didn't run into any issues you know thankfully so and that's not moved up on any priority good based on what they found yeah so far it's looking good you know in the future we run on one there's one boiler systems you know in the in the pools so it'd be nice to in the future to budget you know for another one so they can go off of each other in case one goes down we just have one then the pool shut down yeah. you know so it's something to consider in the future as a capital budget yeah. thank you sir up next, uh, city manager. Well, Chris might be bringing this up uh, in his report, but AG&C has their meeting here tomorrow at the pavilion at 9 o'clock. And uh, I put the itinerary in front of you. If you didn't uh, register for lunch, you won't have lunch because they require RSVP. But bring your own brown, brown bag if you want to attend, I guess. I, usually they have a few extras. I mean, that's There'll be some. typically the case, but... Um, 
Ryan had it on his report, the wayfinding signs. I uh, just wanted to mention that they're up. We're not overly happy with the uh, font and the background on the signage because it's difficult to see from a, a distance. And so they're, they're looking at uh, the owner of the company, Mike, uh, with Platinum Signs, uh, wants to fix that problem. Uh, and so they're, they've already proposed uh, some alternate backgrounds and uh, signage uh, for the, so you can see that uh, signage from a distance, distance with a better contrast. So that's going to be coming. He's going to do it for a very limited cost to improve the the, the uh, lettering on that sign, on those signs. The budget schedule, I think you've seen from Bruce. Uh, the one date uh, that you all uh, might want to have agree upon over the next uh, couple of meetings would be October 1st. If we do the retreat, uh, full day retreat on that on that day, that's a Thursday. Any uh, immediate thoughts about that? I, I, I guess my only thought was last year we we took the effort to start sooner, right? So it wasn't this last minute. I mean, I guess Tony and I spoke last, about this. Last year we were in September. Right? Yes. We Just to have a little bit more time to get people's heads wrapped around things. and. Oh, well, we could pull that back. Uh, just a, curious why the, why the change back to what we were doing versus what we did last year. We still have the same number of meetings planned for the council with two potential meetings. Uh, one of those incorporated into a work session before the before the next meeting in October, and then a full day work session October first. But if you want to do something sooner, we can we can redraft this a little bit. Come back, council. How do you feel about the process? I think last year we spent more time on the budget because we had four new council members right you know at that time didn't we so it is uh, i think last year was the first year we finally for seven years i've asked to start <laughs> when you're going to plan a you know oh, no. 10 20 30 million dollar budget and you're going to do that you can't just go into an october first session and be like Oh, good job, department heads. We're going to approve it. Like, you don't have enough time. And I've been asking that um, that we, we've we done that for seven years. I've been asking that. We start in August. We have a couple work sessions um, so that we, we can make changes before. Because what's happened in the past is we go October 1st, and one, one of the department heads or whoever it is is like, yeah, that's not going to work. And we got to approve this by December. So guess what? Good luck. <laughs> and then we're... we're going backwards instead of planning being proactive we're always reactive and so i think that's the only reason i would like to have it maybe one in august one in september and then we go october 1st or whatever date to really hone in the, the I, thought our, I thought our first meeting last year was in uh, september early september i think last year we actually had one in may we actually had our first one in may and then we went into august september and then october but our first budget session last year was in May. Well, what resonates with me was we had the meeting at the... Uh, we wouldn't have much to present. In yeah. Moment, other I, than... It was just projections. It yeah. was like, hey, these are what we're wanting to do. Was that you the thinking? one we did at the college uh, last year? We... The that was that was a well, and then we had the one at the Hampton or whatever yeah. it was, right? That was September. That was, that was our first formal retreat. Right. That one at the college is when we went through a lot of concept plans on some of the right development efforts and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm open. I add at yeah. least one. Yeah. I I feel like it's it's a more vetted process that way. Why don't we come back to you with a different? Okay. Okay. Next meeting. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I just need fairly significant notice. Just keep banking. You can't, you can't email days. him. You got to make sure you call him. You remember? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I actually have had time to at least look at my emails lately. <laughs> but, uh, but the, the twenty eight. Well, we can get something up. I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter. I just, you know, I just need like maybe two weeks' notice. Yeah, we'll get something up. Before Even if we can have something preliminary in August. Yeah. And kind of a first official meeting sometime September, and then move sure. from there. I, 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 I think is what you're. I'm feeling from council. I agree. Okay, um, EDA grant has been a big uh, part of the 
time consumption here for the and will be for the next week and a half, two weeks. We have to get this thing out the door. As for the Amper River Corridor project, uh, we'll probably have to get something in front of the council uh, on the 28th to kind of uh, endorse the grant submission at some point. Uh, we can always withdraw it, but uh, uh, we have made a lot of uh, headway on the grants. Uh, we have great meetings uh, each week with uh, Ben Alexander with the uh, Resources Legacy Group out of Bozeman, Montana. He's helping us direct the, a lot of the activities. Uh, we're assembling the, the major pieces of the grant. Dave Pike is working with us on some of his connections. Uh, Senator Bennett, we had a great meeting with his uh, Economic uh, Development Office uh, a week ago last Monday. Um, Dana Duran is looking like she might uh, have a good connection, obviously, with El Pomar and possible grant funding to help us with a match on that grant. Um, the Parrot Heads have already committed some funding to the grant. I won't say exactly just how much just yet, but uh, uh, as, as far as the match uh, funding for that, for that project, the Basin Roundtable will, will be presenting at the Basin Roundtable here in the next month or two. And they put us on their, we formally now are listed on their uh, project schedule as uh, a potential for funding through the Basin Roundtable. Uh, the Ampa River Fund and Friends of the Ampa will also be a, a target for potential funding for match funding for this grant. We've had a local business owner, another local business owner that stepped up, um, and he's made a connection, a good connection with the Gates Foundation, and we're going to look to explore that uh, connection to see if there's uh, some further philanthropic uh, match funding uh, from that source. And, of course, we have another uh, a business, second, uh, the first, uh, actually the primary beneficiary that's uh, We'll be providing letters of endorsement. Uh, we have not talked to Tri-State yet for financial support on this partic particular project. We'll initially be looking for letters of support from Tri-State, from Trapper, from Colorado, in addition to the governmental entities uh, on this grant before it goes in. Next Monday, on a different subject, uh, EDC meeting is planned for 2 p.m., uh, we've invited Carolyn White. Uh, she's an attorney with Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek. Uh, she's one of the state of Colorado's foremost attorneys in the development of urban renewal authorities. Uh, we've convinced her to come out here without an hourly fee, which is amazing because her hourly fee is somewhere between four and five hundred bucks an hour. So um, and she is uh, an amazing. Uh, resource when it comes to the development of URAs in this state, and she speaks at almost every CML conference. She is one of the foremost experts in this area. So we're, we're uh, fortunate to have her and come out here and uh, present and uh, go through a Q&A process and the next steps for us to get this off the ground. Um, and uh, obviously all council members uh, that's an open invitation to the meeting. I think it'll be quite interesting to go through that process and see see where we go with the next steps on on URA development. I think that's about it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yep. Appreciate it. Just one real quick. Oh, sure. <clears throat> you mentioned a lot of partners and contributors to the river, you know, project. Yep. You didn't mention the county. We have that discussion with the county, you mentioned the county. The county is part of the meeting and uh, a, okay. a partner. Yeah, because that would be a joint services topic if we. Yeah, absolutely. We we're, we're looking for the county to be a financial partner in this That's, okay. match process. Yeah. Cool. And you also are going to go to the Parrot Head meeting next Tuesday, is that correct? And give a brief presentation on this new information? <clears throat> I am, and Dave Pike will be there as well. Okay. And he's part of that committee. And Okay. I'll attend. Uh, I may have him speak to the point, but uh, I'll be happy to okay. participate in that meeting. Thanks for that. Yeah. Good to have an appearance there. So. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. City Attorney Report. 
Sure. So um, it's been a busy month, uh, starting out with the Senate Bill uh, 20 or 217. Um, so I've spent some time on that. I, I met with um, Jerry and Bill. Um, I've I think I've touched almost every department so far this month, with the exception probably um, of Parks and Rec, but maybe I have. We'll get there. There's still, you know, about 16 days left or so. Um, so, yeah, it's been a busy month. Uh, just, you know, obviously we had uh, the charter reviews meetings. Um, we met about a restorative justice program potentially. I think that was a good meeting that um, the mayor was a part of as well. Um, yeah, it, it's been some water rights this month. It has been a variety of issues that have uh, kind of flown across my desk. So there's no shortage of um, education for me, I would say, in the past 14 days. So we've held up to our promise of something to do. You have. Okay. And it's something new every day, which has been okay. great. So, no, I, I mean, I think it, it's been good. It's been productive. I think we've got a lot done. We wrapped up a temporary easement finally for Trevor. Um, for the sludge line uh, project. So, I mean, there, yeah, there's been some forward movement on a lot of different issues. Awesome. Sure. Thank you. I know you've been very active. <coughs> okay, uh, council reports. Councilwoman Camp. Um, so I attended the MCTA meeting. Um, they talked a lot about their budget and kind of went through that and had those discussions. Um, I did have to leave that meeting early because that was the same evening that we were having our special meeting here. Um, so, you know, just kind of budget talks and kind of the same things we're doing, obviously. Um, I did miss the LMD meeting last week on Thursday. Obviously, my work's been really busy lately, too. So um, those 4 o'clock afternoon meetings don't always work. Um, but I will follow up with probably with Randy Looper on that and just get any new developments from that group. Um, there is the chamber mixer this week, Thursday, from 5 to 7 at the Yampa building. And, of course, they'll be kind of giving that Craft 201 project presentation. But um, I happen to have a chance to go in there this evening and take a look at that. And it's what a great facility. It's just I, I think there's so much potential there. And it's just great to see those organizations kind of in there and milling around. And so, um, so that's going to be a great asset. Um, we'll have our EDC meeting next week on Monday the 20th. And then the only other thing I wanted to mention was just how great the flowers that you ladies are taking care of are looking as well. So we appreciate that also. Thank you. Didn't you, you attended the open house with Tri-State? Oh, I did. Right? Yes, I did. I did pop in there for just a couple minutes. Um, last week, were they here on Thursday? I was trying to remember what day that was too. <laughs> Sorry. Um, maybe it was the same day we met here for our special meeting. But anyway, I did... Yeah. Um, stop in there and visit with them a little bit about uh, kind of my questions were mainly focused on the water rights a little bit and you know kind of where that's headed so um, yeah so good conversation I was glad to have that opportunity and that's it thank you yeah councilman Mazuka. all right so I missed the charter review meeting but you guys all heard what we've been working on for a while now uh, I attended parks and rec don't have anything to add except for what Ryan said except for uh, moving in the park I will be this July, will be July 16th. Um, they'll be playing Frozen. I might be one of the only people who have never actually seen that movie. So really? Maybe I'll, maybe I'll. You should go check it out. Go check it out. Yeah. I need to go. I don't have any kids, so I don't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just let it go. Just let it go. Uh, After you see it, you'll appreciate that, okay? okay. <laughs> uh, attended and worked the uh, Homemade Homegrown Festival. And actually, I had a pretty good turnout for a few of the vendors as I saw out there. It was a pretty good turnout all day. And, uh, of course, I have CNCC, EDC uh, Monday, and I plan on attending the mixer at the uh, Yampa building. Uh, and then the other thing I attended was, uh, not really council, but uh, participated in as well as the uh, JWs. Uh, fundraiser for the popular bar since the popular bar is the only business in town that is still shut down from COVID. Um, right. I'll leave my personal thoughts out of that. Um, but uh, it was amazing the support from the community for all the things that were raffled off and actually just donations for money. Nice. Um, it was, and it's amazing to see one, basically one competitor bar helping another a yeah. bar in the community. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. unbelievable. So. That's, just, that's a great part of that. Really. Yeah, unbelievable. And I never got a call. Did I win anything? <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> They're redrawing some things. Yeah. Okay. That'll work back into it. Yep. Ah, ah. Yeah, it kind of reminded me like the Cowboy, Cowboy Christmas where people bid on stuff and they just turn it back and they bid on it again. You know, they pay out and they 
just donate it back. It's oh, wow. unbelievable. That's the good. generosity in this community. So. Yeah. That's all I got. Okay. Councilman Hess. So I went and watched uh, Steve get auctioned off for $2,100. <laughs> It was kind of funny. Boy, somebody got took, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for 2999 <laughs> Yeah. yeah. For you sure. don't know. I could have gave him a 20 <laughs> um, So I went to Parks and Rex. I think me and Steve have just been following each other the last uh, last month or so. I've been pretty busy with uh, things catching on fire at work. Um, literally, yeah, lots of large fires. I'm watching a quarter of a million dollars worth of airdrops. Um, not really much. Um, Parks and Rec, uh, Charter Review, we've discussed almost everything over in Charter Review. Uh, other than that, nothing really. I plan on going to the mixer. Um, I'll probably go to EDC on Monday, and uh, that's about it. I haven't been to downtown business in a while. We filled in for you one time, but that's about it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Councilman Boyer. Yeah. Um, so we're amazing to me that all the houses that are selling, Andrea would know better than me, that my wife and I have been looking for a house in District 1 so that we could move there finally and have our own place, or my wife was going to find her own place. So, uh, well, you, we, are, you are living there in District 1. We are now. I just yes, wanted to yes, make sure. Yes, we are, but okay. we don't okay. own a place, okay. so we finally got a place that we are. But closings are 60 days out. Isn't that they crazy? can't get appraisals. They can't. I mean, it's just amazing. And it's not just people in Craig buying, supposedly. It's people coming from mm -hmm. outside buying so it's just which is a good thing for craig right especially right now in um what, what we're facing so it's just amazing um i'm coaching my daughter's eight year old uh she's eight years old on the soccer for the parks and rec and the staff out there is just amazing i mean nothing but compliments to to those guys that are whether they're refing or just making sure everything runs smooth it's just it is it's a great thing for sure um Went to the special meeting that we had about the judge. Um, the activity at the admin building's great. The 4th of July fireworks by the mm -hmm. uh, fire department was, was fantastic. Um, you know, um, the only thing really I have is that um, the Wildlife Council, we had a uh, workshop the other day on a Zoom call. And so I told them that I was leaving. So I represent all municipalities in the state on that board. And I told them that I was leaving that um, obviously the city council and so they asked me to go to their county commissioner rep is leaving so i'm going to stay on the board but oh. they're going to be looking for um, an, uh, a municipality representative so i don't know if we want um, someone on this board they want rural america because they deal with um, edu educating um, for for ballot initiatives for the hunting industry sure. so um they are looking for that so i don't know if somebody here on the city wants to step up to that is like every other month you drive to denver and go to their meetings and zoom call the other month so anyway right. that's all that's all i have thank you sir yeah councilman james um i had uh been to the dba meetings um obviously they set up the little mini festival last weekend i wasn't really able to attend that uh, i just kind of you know stepped over on my lunch um but it was pretty cool i did get to get to hear some music and stuff and other than that uh, I'm, I'm gonna do my best to make it to the open house on thursday too for the chamber so but yep and then i got dba in the morning tomorrow too so but that's about it thank you sir Councilman Nichols. Hey, you guys already talk about everything, so <laughs> got me here close to the end. I know how you feel now. <laughs> um, you know, I did it's attend the broadband meeting with Steve Johnson, uh, Audrey Denner put on at uh, County Commissioners, and Andrew was there, and Peter, and you know, got a, more than anything else a report for where Illuminate is and their build out on the broadband structure and. He admitted that they are behind, what, I think he said about six months from where they plan to be at this period of time. Had some uh, contractor issues, but um, he wasn't asking for money or anything else from the city and the county, and just how to better serve the community. And everybody realizes uh, the houses that are selling, the location neutral people moving here, broadband, internet connection is one of the biggest things. So that's setting, setting this up. I did ask the chamber to be a little bit more aggressive in relocation packets and kind of market this a little bit more, you know, and get that out there that, you know, we're a location-friendly 
neutral friendly community. Our co-workspace, yeah, you talked about the Yampa building. Um, you know, the grant that the city originally got uh, paid for the phone system and the connectivity hookup in the building. Also is going to pay for proximity software to get the co-workspace up and running. Uh, city workers are participating with setting up the tables and desks and moving all that, so I appreciate that. Road and Bridge, I appreciate the work you do for parades and getting those all set up and making sure traffic control. Fireworks were brought up. Um, you know, Craig, the fire department's been busy. You know, the, the 4th of July, they started out with a structure fire at 3.48 a.m., and then there was another one at 5.38 or 5.30-something. Uh, and then, of course, then they're set up on the fireworks, and then they had several ambulance, ambulance assist runs that day, plus um, several, several brush fires, but, you know, started with fireworks. Jerry's crew were busy. There were fireworks all over town. I mean, there was a better show behind my house up on the hill, almost as good as the fire department. Just so everybody remembers that the city contributes, the county contributes, and the fire district puts in, you know, to put on that show. And we're lucky to have a sense of normalcy in our community with fireworks. Uh, luckily, uh, Chris Olson, who... who puts on and orders our fireworks, got the order in early because a lot of people that didn't have fireworks show might have said it was COVID restrictions, but there was a massive shortage of fireworks because uh -huh. they come from China, gotcha. the bulk of them. Mm -hmm. So, but we had the show. Um, you know, you guys already mentioned the, the, the popular bar fundraiser, but it was just great to see the community working together on that as well. Businesses to businesses. Um, homegrown event. Councilman Mazuka was on the percussion instruments all day long, right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, that you know that was a decent turnout. It was good. AGNC tomorrow. Attend if you want. Chamber mixer. Um, you know that it's already been said, but that building just. I'm glad the city stepped up, the school district, and everybody stepped up. Um, that's a great environment to foster you know, the relationships and build the community even more. Yeah. You know, with the Senior Living Center there, you know, the artists up, you know, there. We have private businesses, leasing space, you know, Farm Bureau Insurance. And you walk through that building, and it really looks nice. Mm -hmm. Now if they can get the air conditioning fixed. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, joint services next week. That's why I was asking about the Yampa Trail there. And... And making sure we keep that going forward. Um, that's about it. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I don't feel the need to be super redundant. Uh, you guys go to everything I go to or vice versa. Um, school board meeting, charter review. I did attend the opioid epidemic, epidemic webinar. Uh, interesting information as usual. Um, we had uh, the nice thing about that is that uh, group actually has some implementation dollars, so it's it's they can kind of partner, they can figure some stuff out, and there's actually some money to get something done. So many times it seems like when the feds mandate something or the state does, they tell you to do this and then figure out how to finance it. So at least this one's got some money behind it. Like yes, yes, exactly, something like that. Yeah, correct. Um, Parks and Rec meeting uh, was good. We had, as Heather mentioned, I attended the Juvenile Municipal Court service, Services discussion. I think we're going to make some headway there. Um, had felt like a lot of the right people at the table. Um, the school district um, hired a new principal for Ridgeview Elementary, for those who are not aware. Mr. Haddon re uh, resigned and took a position. I never say it right. It is way out eastern Colorado. Um, buffoon. It's not buffoon. It's not. It's buffoon? it sounds like that. No, it's it's like buffoon. No, it's it's it's. I'm literally saying it very close to right. It's not buffoon. I'll be honest, but it's very close to that. You have to look it up. But uh, he took a superintendent position out there, um, so we replaced him uh, with a gentleman from Parachute. Uh, so busy doing that, and yeah, next week we have all kinds of meetings. It looks like again. I will not be able to attend, attend AGNC tomorrow because we are 
very busy at the district uh, figuring out what reopening school looks like. So we can get that out to the public. So that is all I have. So moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> Are you sending on this morning? Are you going to school? Oh, uh,